halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head hanging out up until 3 o'clock today here on the game in Columbia, Florence, Myrtle Beach. Thanks for hanging out with us as we roll this baby. Oh, let's see. These, these, uh, these ours? They almost look too good to be our headphones. Uh, whoa, I got to turn this down. Dave had these headphones way too loud in here. I'm blowing out my eardrums. There we go. Dave, can you not hear? <laughs> All right. So we are, So we are. like I said, only what? Two days away now from the yes. spring game. Uh, okay. We are 55 hours exactly. 55 hours. 55 hours. Until, I want to say kickoff, but they don't kick off in the spring game. No. Until the first snap at the 25-yard line. Yes, that's what will happen. <laughs> yes. A little, little less exciting when you say it that way. Uh -huh. um, so, as we sit here, and we just, what we just want it to happen now, right? We've been talking about yeah, it and, and talking and, about it. And we, oh, look, we hear from the players, hear from the coaches, and we got tons of uh, players that we heard from yesterday that we'll get to. But, like, we don't get to see anything, hardly. Like, like Wes and Chris, they're out there. They get to see these little sessions of, mm -hmm. you know, a couple reps of this drill, that drill, whatever. And, like, we are prying off of that little information that we get to try and figure out what we're going to see on Saturday night. But that's 5% at best of what is happening in these practices. And, yes. again, that's one day a week. Yeah. So, like, what we see on Saturday may be completely against what we've heard and what we've read about up to this point. Sure, and we got to remember what we're going to see Saturday's nothing. Yeah, I mean, it's vanilla, take it with a grain of salt, right. all that stuff. Like, it's not, and especially in today's age, I think Preston brought up a really good point. You know, back in the day, spring games weren't nationally televised. Spring Ooh. games were, if you didn't go to it, you didn't see it type yeah. things. But that's another opportunity for teams to get film on you. Sure. And say, oh, hey, that freshman quarterback, you know, what we saw what he did in that spring game, let's kind of figure him out a little bit. Like, you're not going to give your opponents anything right. more than what you have to did, up to this point. Did you notice the route combinations that they ran when uh, the quarterback rolled to his right? Yeah. And did you see, hey, I think I see a tell you know, on the left tackle you know puts his hand in a certain place when they run the ball. Dal, if you're listening, run the triple option on Saturday. How good would that be? I, I told you what Brian Kelly did at, at the Ohio State spring game. Their first play, they yeah. came out in a wing tee. How funny is that? I'm like, they're not running a wing tee but it was a it was a nice Chip little Kelly. tongue in cheek Chip like Kelly. Hey, look, look what we're doing type right. thing yeah but and i don't think chip's running the uh, wing tee chip doesn't know what the wing tee is <laughs> somebody had to tell him like hey you know this is what they did back in 1940 he's like well you mean well, the, wait wait the quarterback takes it under center what's that about well, would it be funnier if chip was sitting around because you know he was you remember he, he was for a while there like an innovator right Chip sure. kelly sure and what if he said he's funny, he's sitting in his office, he's doodling, scribbling. What if I put the quarterback here and I put a, a running back here, like out there in that little slot area? We could call him a slot, but a wing. And he comes, he goes, yeah. all of a sudden he walks yeah. in and he goes, I, th I thought of something really cool. Yeah, he did that yeah. in 1942. Guys, I, I got an idea. Quarterback is right underneath the center. You have the running back behind him and between him, let's call it a fullback. And they're lined up. In an eye. We'll call it an eye formation. Because it looks like an eye. Because it looks like, no, nobody's doing this. Nobody's doing this. This is, this is, I can't believe no one's ever thought of this before, Chip. But, but you know what? In a weird way, we always talk about history repeating itself. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we're, we're West Coast high-flying offense. Everybody's taking it from the shotgun and, you know, motion, all this kind of stuff. Do you think football eventually kind of starts reverting back? Not completely, but to featuring more of that stuff because it'll be so foreign at that point in time? Well, it'll be foreign. And, too, remember this. What do you build a defense to do? Stop an offense. Yes. So if your offense is filled, you're four wides, you know, you're all this multiple and you're wide open and you're playing space and pace and all this. So your, def so your defenders get what? They're lighter and faster and more athletic. Yep. So they Just can match up with your offense. Throat. So sometime at some point, someone's going to go, you know what? I'm going to go back to 1975. I'm going to get some big road grader offensive linemen. We're going to run the eye, and we're just going to run the ball. We're going to pound that thing 60 times a game and run them over. I see I see the first day of practice. Gentlemen, this here's a phone booth. That's exclusively what we're going to be playing football in from now forward. You know, it's interesting. I mean, it, not like we're saying, but Michigan kind of did that last year. 
A little bit, yeah. They're, they're, they're a little they, against. They have tight ends and fullbacks yeah. and all that stuff. And they, they remember they ran their offense through their run game, not their they quarterback. D- they did, and you know when they established a very dominant run game with guys like Blake Corm and you know JJ McCarthy, who is looking to be a top five pick in next week's draft. Didn't have to do a whole lot. Now, there were situations against Alabama, against TCU the year before in the playoff game where, hey, he had to put it in his hands and had to wheel it, you know, let it fly around a little bit and did that job. But for the most part, it's like, all right, Mm -hmm. bud, hand it off, throw for a buck 20, don't throw any interceptions, and we're good. Yeah, so, I mean, Michigan didn't do what we were kind of having fun with, but Michigan... They're kind of toward that road more than they are wide open. Sure. You know, we're going four or five wides. You know, we're we're going to hold up pictures of Lee Corso for plays. And, you but know. Man, here's the thing. It takes a football genius like Jim Harbaugh to make that work. The, the average coach probably isn't going to be as successful. And, again, you got to have the right players, too. Oh, sure. Well, you think about it for a minute. Uh, there's a reason why the game has gone this way. And it's very difficult then to try to come back with what used to work because the way the game's evolved. Right. But, again, at some point, someone's going to say, wow, those linebackers weigh 215 pounds. Yeah. Let's run them over. And if someone's successful, going back to the old Nebraska offense of the 80s, then guess what's going to happen? Because, you know, the world's copycatters. That's right. And then, boom. I mean, you know, Joe Tiller was a – was an offensive genius at Purdue because he was running the, at that point, it was called, I guess, the run and shoot. Yep. Nobody in the Big Ten threw the ball. The Big Ten got together when uh, Tiller at, at, at Purdue uh, was throwing the ball 40, 50 times. They're all going, what the hell is he doing? Well, you can do that. What is that thing? That's I, legal? I thought we had a limit on eight forward <laughs> passes a game. Just, so, and then now everyone is wide open and people are running variations on mike leach's offense or whatever so it's someone's gonna try it tyler someone's gonna look at these defenses and go hmm maybe we need to go back to smashing the mouth of people and we'll see where it goes so it's it's all what is that cyclical comes in cycles cyclical be honest with you though i like this brand of football much more oh it's it's more entertaining it's it's fun um, there's a reason the NFL continues to skew its rules towards the offense because high-flying, lots of points, lots of yards, that, that's more entertaining football. It is. And do, do, look, I respect defense. I know you got to be able to play defense to win and to win championships. you got to be good defensively. I get all that. But from just the entertainment value, this is fun. I appreciate a dominant defense. Like, if a defense, like, and... People are going to get on me for this. George's defense in his first national championship here in 2021. Mm-hmm. That defense was unbelievable. Oh, sure. I legitimately enjoyed watching the defense because they. Were, I was like, mm-hmm. can they shut another team out? Can they hold this team under 150 yards? Mm-hmm. Like, that's fun defense to watch for me. Oh, yeah. Because it's just like ungodly amounts of dominance. Well, because they're imp- – what's, what's the football saying? They're imposing their will. Exactly. Right? exactly. But for me, to down down your point, the 2000 Raven defense. Yeah, there you go. I mean, they scored more points than the Raven offense. Yeah, I mean, they like, just they they destroyed people. And now Trent Dilfer's forever the the butt of the jokes when it comes to who's the worst quarterback oh, to win a Super Bowl. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only time you ever replace a Super Bowl winning quarterback. That's how much you know they thought of Trent Dilfer. But so yes, I will agree with you. If you're watching a dominant defense, but if you're watching two bad offenses and and, and they're not scoring points. And the defense is looking good because the offenses suck so bad. Yeah. There's no fun in that. And that can be something, especially in the college game, not so much the pro game, but the college game, you can almost be fooled sometimes into thinking the defense is really good, but then you're like, oh, well, they've just gone up against crappy offenses for a couple of weeks. Exactly. And they're just, you know, they're they're, they're just like physically better or whatever. They're not technically better. Yeah. Or they, they just have some, uh, well, that offense is so bad. And from the system to the players, then it makes every defense look good, right? You walk right. off the field going, yeah, baby. Right. Look at us. No, it's because that offense is terrible. Yeah. So I don't even know how we started this. But anyway, spring game, that's where we were. Here we go. <laughs> that was one of those. That was one of those that was like, how did we end up here? But so we'll, we will, uh, in a couple, 55 hours, 54 hours and 50 minutes, we'll get the spring game. And... You know, and I and I don't do this, and I try not to, just because years of years ago when you were younger, you did it, and then you realize you shouldn't. Try not to make a big big thing too much out of somebody who's too good. Don't make a big thing out of somebody who struggles, because but, it's it's just a it's it's a spring game. But we will, because, because that's what people do, and that is all that we have to go off of until mm-hmm. Old Dominion in week number one. And 
and not to be mean, how much are you going to be able to glean off of Old Dominion? Uh, probably not a whole lot. I, I think more of the sites are set on, again, this isn't disrespecting the Monarchs, mm. but you should, you should your win talent level, be able to beat that team yes. without too much fa- fanfare. You should win that game. It's week two is where you really are going to start getting some kind of uh And by the way, that's a Kentucky idea. team we don't know a whole lot about either because they've yet. had a lot of turnover themselves, a lot of guys coming in the portal. Like, it's two teams that are going to be looking at each other, not really knowing what exactly the other team has. Right. I mean, you got Brock Vandergriff now the quarterback. you got a new offensive coordinator. You know, like you said, a lot of transfer portal turnover at Kentucky. So we'll see. But spring game is coming up. Of course, we'll, we'll do, be doing the broadcast this Saturday, starting right after the end of uh, Carolina baseball against Arkansas. We will roll the spring game uh, exclusively right here on 107.5 The Game in Columbia. I will get back in here. A lot of players sound. We want you to hear from some of the folks that are going to uh, run on the field Saturday and one that isn't but had some interesting comments. We'll start with the quarterback, Lenar Sellers, in our next segment. And we're going to go with, uh, we'll come back on, uh, with the idea of how he's progressed in his second year. That's coming up next. Terry Ford, Tyler Head. It is the halftime show till three here on the game.
Um, I'm just saying, like, I understand the system now. Like, last year, I was just pretty much learning it, like, taking it on the fly, really. But this year, like, I actually understand, like, the process of the system, understand, like, why plays, like, happen the way they do and why routes are there. And it just came a lot slower to me. Well, that's what you want to hear. There's Lenore Sellers. You're going, oh, that sounds really good. The game slowed down. Now you're getting into the deep dive of why and this and that and the things you need to learn from the neck up as a quarterback. If you're listening to that, you're going, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's definitely that's the, the, the right things that you want to hear. And look, you know, uh, another year on your belt, you've obviously been through the fall. You've seen everything up close and personal. I imagine the spring, especially when you're going up against the guys that you've been practicing against every single day for the better part of the past year, it probably is slowing down a little bit. And again, that's got to translate over into when you're actually playing in the fall. But, um, you know, it sounds like he's on track. Guy's got so much physical ability. We, we saw it sure. t at times last year when we he saw was in the, playing. Saw in the spring game last year. Saw it in the spring game. We saw it, you know, when he threw the touchdown pass against, was that Furman? Um, he threw the pass to Russell against Furman. He, he ran, ran for the touchdown for against, the Vandy. against Vanderbilt. Right. Which apparently that wasn't even designed. He just did Took it on off. his own, which when it works, that's great. Yep. I'm sure he got a little. Now, listen, next time, let's go with the play that's called. We know when it didn't work, uh, you can, that school up north with uh, their quarterback, remember, yeah. uh, ran the, uh, decided he was gonna, just going to keep it and try to go around left end. He did that a few times last year. And it didn't work out very well. So, again, like you said, when you just kind of freestyle and it works, you got a, in, you got intense feel for the game. Well, and, and you know, no disrespect to Vanderbilt. He was probably more talented and athletic than just about everybody on the defense. I would say yes. So mm -hmm. when you're going up against Oklahoma and Ole Miss and Alabama, it's a different story. So you do have to stay on line with what the game plan is. And, and the idea that for all the physical gifts you can have, and look, in the college game, you get away with it more than the pro game. Sure. But there is certain... There's a certain amount of leeway your physicality and athleticism will get you. But when it's all said and done, you're still going to have to use what's between your ears, process a defense, it, you know, read what you got to read, make the correct throw and make that throw accurately because that that's the fundamental tenet of playing this position is being able to play it from the neck up. Yeah, and from every indication that we've gotten, I mean, he's mm -hmm. sat in here with – us and Lingard and Trust Hour seems like a smart kid oh, and seems to understand the game of football at that deep level to play quarterback effectively in the SEC. Again, we are assuming he's the starter. He's still got to win the job, and that's what people are going to be really paying attention to the most coming up on Saturday is, okay, Sellers and Ashford, who looks better mm -hmm. in the spring game, which, again, doesn't decide the quarterback spot, but in the public perception, given that's all that we're going to see, it's going to go a long way in people's eyes. Because really, look, we, as sports talk people, media, fans, most folks think Lenore Sellers is a starter. Yeah. That a quote-unquote competition, and not to say it's a fake competition, but the competition really isn't even. Robbie Ashford has to go catch up to Lenore Sellers and take that starting job. And if it's anywhere near an even battle, it's going to go to Sellers. Right. So we all just think, okay, go through this, let's go through all the hoops, and then we'll get to Old Dominion and Sellers will be the starting quarterback. What if you get what what because you know what if? I mean it's a spring game. And it doesn't mean any it doesn't mean everything, but what if Robbie Ashford just balls out Saturday? It's possible. I mean, again, this is a guy that's started in the SEC before. He's a four he's already, star recruit. He's already won a job prior, so mm -hmm. it's not out of the realm of possibility i mean he his biggest problem is he had issues throwing the football accurately yes but he can make plays with his legs he can make stuff happen when he tucks it and takes off what if all of a sudden after working with dow Loggins and the offensive staff they changed his footwork they worked on his mechanics and all of a sudden he's throwing the ball better than he ever has in his life then we'll go well maybe maybe there is a competition after all sure but right now no one feels like there's a real competition at quarterback they yeah. just feel like you're going and, through the competition motions, right, right. until well, you get to and, what's going to happen. And every time we've heard from Beamer, every time we've heard from Dow, they give us the spiel of, hey, everybody looks good, everybody's throwing the ball good, running good, whatever. Like, they're not giving us 
you know, the rundown of, all right, well, right now it's 70% Lenora's, 30% mm -hmm. Robbie. Like, well, we're not going to truly know that until they make a decision. All right, let's, let's roll to cut three here real quick. Um, Tyler, uh, Seller's talking about his second spring with Dow Loggins, or like we're finding out, D-Lo. Uh, yeah, he's more intense this year, I'll say. Like, last year he was intense too, but this year just, like, he has an edge about him, I'll say. Like, I love D-Lo. I love his coaching. Like, I've always had a uh, stand-up funny guy. Like, he'll be honest with you all the time. So, I feel like this year he's just more intense, like, more attention to detail this year, like, with everybody in the room rather than just, like, because Spencer knew his stuff last year, so he didn't have to really, like, tell him much. But this year it's more like, you got to just tell everybody and coach everybody, like, differently based on their strengths. Which is something Dow Loggins has said a lot that, you know, you build your offense around the strength of your players. Yeah. And, and Lenoris is going a little bit further saying, look, he's, he's building all of this on the strength of, like, for example, okay, my wide receiver room. What's my strengths of my wide receivers? I got a lot of guys who we think are yak yard guys, slottish type of guys, smallish guys, but if you get the ball in their hands, they can make some dudes miss. And, you know, big plays could come. You don't have a rangy 6'4", 6'3", traditional guy that's going to be out wide of the so wide of the hash marks and is going to have a big catch radius who's going to just, you know, jump ball you to death down the field. You don't have that guy. So how do you build your offense around these receivers, right? Yeah. And your offensive line, how do they block best? Are they better in a zone blocking scheme or are they better in some other type of blocking schemes how are how do you build your protections with this offensive line your run game your running backs are they are they cutback runners are they one cut and go runners what kind of runners do you have so all this goes into probably how from what we surmise of dow loggins he's building his offense upon the strength of his players he's taking his quote-unquote system or his beliefs and he's now going to mold it to the guys he has, which to me is how you build an offense. Well, and I think, you know, going back to Seller's quote there, I think there's also an intensity from the standpoint that, like, you're the guy now. Like, mm -hmm. you're assumed to be the guy now where, you know, last year when you came in, Spencer Rattler, who had been around the college game for a long time, kind of knew what was up and already been there and done that. Maybe the intensity wasn't quite there as much because he knew that the quarterback that he had and the one that he was building the offense around – was already up to speed on a lot of things where you're having Lenore Sellers who again got on the field some last year but never in any dire meaningful situations it was garbage time um so there is that intensity of like hey here's what you got to get ready for here's what we're building the offense to do just making sure you're ready for it and it'll be a different offense because Lenore Sellers strengths are different than Spencer Rattler's strengths right and with with Rattler I think with Dow Loggins he saw this guy who was already doing things that you ain't got to teach him. He gets it. He's, again, NFL arm talent. You know, Rattler can make throws. A lot of dudes can't. You know, there are things that Rattler is doing on the field that Loggins doesn't have to teach him. But what Loggins had to do, again, had to teach the gunslinger out of him, had to get him to make better decisions, and not put the ball in harm's way, but still go try to make plays. So, really, Loggins was working on a whole nother level when it came to Rattler. Right. And to your point, this one's starting from almost scratch. Yeah, you got athleticism with Sellers. And yes, he's got, he, he can throw it down the field too, and he can make plays with his legs and all this. But now you're working, you're building a quarterback out of this guy. Yep. And that's and, probably why the he's a lot more intense. And I think some offensive coordinators probably like that kind of thing where you can truly mold this guy into mm -hmm. being the type of quarterback that you want him to be as opposed to, and, and again, they built the offense around Spencer Rattler that year, but Spencer Rattler was was set as a quarterback going into last season. You were not going to drastically change his game or his style of play in year number five at that point in time. Lenore Sellers, again, still early on enough, if he is going to be your guy, again, not giving him the job just yet, but if he is going to be your guy, you can say, okay, well, we want to lean more towards this, want him to do this, and kind of change things up based on what he gives you from an athleticism and a skill standpoint. You had to tweak with Rattler. You're building with Sellers. Exactly. And the other part is there, you know, there is probably a thing with Loggins is, wow, we're taking this guy from scratch. We're building this thing right from the studs. Yeah. Yes. We're not taking a house that's really nice. We're just doing some improvements. We're not just redoing the kitchen. We're building this thing from the from the ground, baby. We know Dow gets very excited when he talks about football. We've had him on here plenty of times, and sometimes you got to cut him off because his answers are going too long. If you gave him just a, an unfiltered amount of time to mm -hmm. tell you everything he wanted to do with Lenore Sellers, he'd probably go on for an hour at oh, least. no doubt. No doubt. 
All right. Um, speaking of Carolina football tonight, 6 p.m., Shane Beamer, Carolina Calls, the spring game week edition of Carolina Calls with Shane. Again, that is tonight at 6 here on the game in Columbia and also Myrtle Beach. We will spin back in here. I heard some Lenar Sellers. Now let's get to some Rocket Sanders. Will not be playing in the spring game, but Rocket Sanders available to the media yesterday. So we will hear from the uh, brand new shiny Carolina running back next on the halftime show. Terry Ford and Tyler Hedger on the game.
Halftime show. Terry Ford Tyler head here on the game. Before we uh, get jumping into some Rocket Sanders, it's 803-875-MENS. That's a men's clinic of South Carolina. We, we talked about this now for, geez, a couple years. You're a guy, you don't like talking about stuff, you're just not feeling like you used to. You can sit there and go, oh, I'm just getting old. Yeah, okay, yeah, duh, we're all getting old. But you don't have to accept what could be happening to you, whether it's your sleep stinks, you have a lack of life drive, professional drive, sex drive, personal drive, whatever. Your workouts are getting worse, you're getting weaker, you can't bounce back from workouts. You don't know where you set your keys and you're looking around for an hour and you find out, oh, they're in my pocket. Go to the men's clinic, make that call, 803-875-MENS. A free confidential consultation with Dr. Dan and the staff. If they think you have low T, they will do lab work. If it is low testosterone, they'll put you on a program to get you feeling like you again. 803-875-MENS, Men's Clinic of South Carolina. All right, Rocket Sanders, uh, talking with the media. Here's a guy that we really haven't uh, heard, seen a lot of, whatever. The, the mysterious Rocket Sanders, who, if healthy, will be the starting running back at South Carolina this fall. Uh, here is Sanders. Let's go with uh, cut, uh, cut, cut, cut seven, uh, Tyler, talking about where he's at in his recovery. Uh, I'll probably say no. Nah, actually, I feel like I've been, I've been, a, and I'm in a spot to where um, I feel like the process is going fast. Actually, you know, um, I didn't know I was going to be here, you know, but um, where I'm at right now, I feel like I'm in the best position right now with my body. All right, and this is a torn labrum that what uh, Sanders had. Yep. So again, it's your shoulder. Kind of important when you're a running back. Yeah. Your shoulders are a thing. Going to be uh, taking all that impact. Yes. Your shoulders get hit a lot. You lean in with your shoulders. You do So your shoulders are a thing if you're a running back. So obviously you want Sanders 150% healthy moving into the opener against Old Dominion. You won't see him in the spring. And we'll see where he's at by the time you get to summer camp. Uh, Sanders also talking about the similarities of the offense they're putting in here at South Carolina compared to the offense that he played in at Arkansas. This is, I feel like it's a little changing, you know, uh, I feel like it's it's somewhat the same, but just a little tweak tweak to it. Um, I feel like it's 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 some good stuff going on, going in, and I feel like it's it's something that I had my freshman and sophomore year for sure. So it's remember Dow Loggins was where before he came to South Carolina, Arkansas. So he was in Arkansas working with Kendall Bryles and the offense they ran there for, you know, Rocket Sanders, K.J. Jefferson, you know, and that crew at Arkansas. Um, and so that gives us a little idea of, all right, you know, you, you had an offense there. K.J. Jefferson could do damage with his legs, just like Lenore Sa uh, Sellers. You know, Jefferson got better as time went on throwing the football. And we hope Sellers is a little bit more farther along as a passer than Jefferson was. Right. But still, sort of a similar offense. And speaking of K.J. Jefferson, Here's Rocket comparing the quarterbacks now, like Sellers or Robbie Ashford, to KJ Jefferson at Arkansas. Yeah, um, actually, when I was at Arkansas, KJ was he was a good, he was big size, he was big size for sure. But Lenore's, I feel like he's a he's a smart guy, you know, uh, he knows his stuff. Um, I feel like Robbie as well. He's he he came a long way when I first when I first saw him. Um, of course, he ain't know too much about the offense, but um, I feel like he absorbing the offense pretty well, and um, he's a fat, definitely fast guy. So basically, you know, K.J. Jefferson might have been bigger and more physical, but, you know, Sanders is saying, you know, uh, Lenore's the mental part of the game, maybe Sellers is a little farther along at this point in his career than K.J. Jefferson was at the same point. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to what he said about the offenses, obviously there are going to be a lot of similarities given the fact that you're running a similar type of offense with the quarterback that, you know, I don't want to say is primarily going to be running the ball. That's going to be a big part of what they do with RPOs and zone mm -hmm. reads and that kind of stuff. And, um, again, going back to the smarts of, of being a quarterback, being able to read those things effectively to know if to, to keep it or hand it off. And, um, you know, again, uh, Rocket Sanders has great experience in that type of offense, which hopefully translate, assuming he's good and ready to go, but when the time of the season starts, to um, being successful this fall. And that's what we're hoping for. And that's what matters, to be ready for Old Dominion. Everything else is whatever. Just want to make sure that Rocket Sanders trots on the field with the first string offense uh, against the Monarchs. Let's grab another Rocket Sanders here. Uh, talking about you know, having to watch from the sidelines this spring.
I feel like, uh, you know, at Arkansas, it was, it was, that's when it happened, you know, uh, well, not even with my shoulder, but with my knee. And um, during the season, it's a, it was a little awful for me, just because I'm not used to watching and observing, you know, and watching, well, a lot of, wa watching a lot of film for sure, but just observing and not playing. But when I came here, I feel like they made me feel like family. So it was like, when I'm out there, um, I'm encouraging the running backs, even though I'm not there, like 24-7 watching them. But um, just whenever, whenever we're in the film room, just, I feel like, just absorbing the film and helping them out. Definitely Jawan. So it's just a little different feeling, a little different vibe. Remember, Sanders is a little bit older now since uh, the first injury. And maybe South Carolina, maybe they're doing a better job of keeping him engaged. Sure, sure. No, he, so. he, he's, he's playing a big role in what is a revamped running back room. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure his insight and his knowledge, having played not only a lot of college football, but in the SEC especially, yep. is helping out these guys that are coming into the SEC for the first time. And with Rocket Sanders, even if he was participating in spring, he doesn't have to prove anything to us. We know what he's capable of when he's at his healthiest. The primary objective is get healthy, get to as close to 100%, and go out there and be as productive this fall. Yeah, and one last uh, cut here from Sanders talking about his new running backs coach, uh, Coach Blackwell, cut 11 there, Tyler. Uh, I feel like he remind me of uh, my coach at Arkansas, uh, Coach Smith, definitely. Um, I feel like he's a guy that keeps us 100, 100 in the room. Um, I feel like that's a big part of just coaching all around. I feel like keeping 100 with the guys is the big, the number one thing I see. Um, definitely, like I said, definitely 100, keep 100 type of guy. Um, know, his, know about the offense, know about, about the streams. Um, he learning as well, so he know a lot. Like I said, he know a lot about the offense. Um, teaching us about uh, the defense, you know, learning the front. So I feel like he, he knows his stuff, and um, I can't wait to get going with him this season. Blackwell, we don't know much because he hasn't really been talking. Right. For some reason. Everybody else has been just not Coach Blackwell. But would you hear there that makes you think back, what wasn't going on previously, and Shane Beamer said something about this, was when he was discussing the running back coach position, is there's things that do, do not need to come out of the running back room that land in the head coach's office? Yes. And that tells us that there were things coming out of the running back room that was landing in the head coach's office. And you heard it from my coach Blackwell coaching the room at 100. The other thing was, remember the recruiting piece. Mm -hmm. South Carolina was losing running backs. And the Marshawn Lloyd thing, from what you hear and read and see, that was pretty sloppy deal how that all went down now again how much of that do you go to your running back coach and go hey uh bro what's up with this what's up with this guy did, did you know this was coming did you communicate uh was there something was there hey, 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 hey. Hmm. so that's another thing i don't know how much of all that was involved but there were things with the previous running back coach coach hardesty it felt like was bigger than just the coaching the player on the field if that makes any sense yeah um there was also you know going back to last spring where we knew south carolina needed another running back out of the portal and they weren't able to land one now that doesn't fall specifically on the shoulders of coach hardis he could have played a factor the carry on joiner not panning out as a running back and again you're you're taking a chance with a guy that never played the position before mm -hmm. doing that in year number six of his college career mm -hmm. essentially like that's a tough ask but it wasn't even remotely close to what we were hoping for. It did not pan out very yeah, well. Yeah, and how much, and you're right, how much do you put on on the running back coach for not being able to coach up Joyner to become a consistently productive had, running back? He had the athleticism and, and, and plenty of skill where you could see it it, working, it just didn't end up happening. And, again, offensive line wasn't great. There's right. a, lot of, a lot of moving pieces here. A lot of moving here, parts, but... but that how certainly much, could have played a factor. Yeah, how much of that goes back to your running back coach? In your mind as the head coach, obviously... There were enough things there for Shane that he wanted to move forward and go get another running back coach. Yes. So we, we just brought up like four or five different scenarios. It could have been all of them, could have been one of them, could have been a little piece of each, it, it, whatever, it, we don't know. I think it all plays mm -hmm. some kind of part. Yeah, basically, my it, guess is for Shane Beamer, the perfect running back coach would be a guy that could coach up the backs on the field, get them at their maximum ability and productivity, be able to recruit, be able not only to recruit backs to come in, but recruit the backs that are already in the room not to leave. Right. And yeah. not have any unnecessary yeah. things come out of the running back room and land in the head coach's office. And that was the tricky part about moving on from Hardesty when they did, because you basically had all these guys 
already come in from the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. So you come in thinking you're going to play for Coach Hardesty. Oh, you sorry he got fired. Now we're going to go out and get Monterey or um, uh, Markwell Blackwell instead. And again, from what we've heard so far, everything seems to be going well. But that that is a risky proposition when you already have a full running back room and then you change the running back coach. All right, uh, coming back, we will check out the firehouse subtext of the hour at 803-404-6100. Hear what you have to say on the old text line. So that is next. Also, do not want to remind you, open up my paper so I can see it. $925. I wanted to make sure I had that number right before I talked about Still it. Still going. You can go to 1075thegame.com, register for the Palmetto Citizens uh, Federal Credit Union Grand Slam giveaway. You're like, Tara, why should I waste my time? 925 reasons why you should waste your time. You know what's going to happen? Friday night, they're going up against Hagen Smith, mm-hmm. who's going to be a top 10 pick in the draft. Mm-hmm. Like, this dude is uh, as good a pitcher as you're going to see he can deal. in college baseball. Mm-hmm. Watch it happen against him. <laughs> It'll be the Grand Slam off of Hagen Smith. <laughs> if it is, and your name gets picked, you get... Uh, pocket $950 because that'll be another game. Right now, $925. Um, no, it'll be 925 if there's a Grand Slam hit on Friday. You got to go to 1075thegame.com to register. It's real simple. Go to our website and you see that little flippy thingy at the top. Once a flippy thingy flips on the uh, Grand Slam giveaway, you click there. You fill out the little entry form. It'll take you like 12 seconds and then you're in and you possibly could win 925 bucks. It's from our... Uh, Good buds at the Palmetto Citizens Federal Credit Union, the Grand Slam giveaway. We'll come back in here. Your text of the hour from Firehouse Sub on 803-404-6100 on the Halftime Show here on The Game.
Time to check the old uh, firehouse sub text of the hour on our text line 803 Four four sixty one hundred. What do you got there, man? Uh, yeah, Tiger Hater weighs in and asks, "Is the spring game televised this year?" It is. You can watch it on the SEC Network Plus. But I got a better idea. You can listen to it on the game, and you can turn the sound down while you're watching it. Exactly. And listen to it on the or game. Or if you're in Williams Bryce Stadium, you can also listen to it while watching the game in there. Yes, because you can go on popular one zero seven five the game app, Google Play, iTunes. And so Wes and Chris won't tell me what their exact assignments are for this game. They said i got to tune in to see. So I'm mm-hmm. assuming Chris is going to be on play-by-play. No. No? No. 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 I'm not going to let him touch that. No. You I love, the, I love him to death. You don't he, think he'd be a good play-by-play guy? Maybe one day. You don't think he's got the, the, the excitement level? You mean just to, the natural ability just to go start spewing play-by-play gold? Yeah. Yeah, probably not at this point. But I think what he's going to be doing, he's going to kill it. I'm sure he will. He will. And Wes, I'm sure Wes is going to do a fabulous job doing what he's doing. So it'll be it'll be good. I look forward to tuning in and they finding are, out. They are both, I think they're both going to do uh, fabulous in, in what they're going to do. And Chris Miller does the play-by-play for us from Learfield. That's right. So Chris Miller will be on the play-by-play. And I'm just going to be bringing people food. So... They're going to have your banana pudding, right? <laughs> yeah. It better. Say, so, well, if, if, if it's not, you're not coming. I will just, you know, we'll just shut everything down. And we'll just play music. And I'll go find banana pudding. Good banana pudding uh, in the yeah. press box. It, here's the thing. I, I was, like, never, like, crazy about banana pudding. Mm-hmm. But since we started doing... The pregame show last fall where banana pudding was readily available yes. every day, every week <laughs> afterwards. I'm very much into banana pudding now. I'm going to tell you, man, because, again, where I, my family, my dad's side of the family is from the hills of North Carolina, right yep. by the North Carolina-Tennessee border. Yep. It, I mean, they just had, they had kegs of banana pudding. Well, and say, like, I've never been against it. It's just not something that, like, I've readily... Well, your family my wasn't life. My into family it wasn't like my into dad, like my side of my family. Whatever for my reason, dad. but but like I said, we were out at TEC Equipment Rentals last Friday, and they had little things of banana pudding. I'm like, oh yes, I will take some of that. And and then now now see you have to go back to that. Now I get annoyed with the fact you didn't bring me containers of banana oh, pudding. So yeah, look, you, you were hanging out with some high rollers that day. <laughs> That's right, I was. I knew I was going to have to bring some for everyone, <laughs> and I didn't have that much. And what if what if our said high roller wasn't into banana pudding? <laughs> Well, I'm more of a tapioca person. I don't know how to help you out there. I love some tapioca. You know what? Bread pudding. You know, I'm trying to remember if I've had bread pudding. I feel like I have. I feel like I wasn't overly impressed by it. If I did, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. Because I love bread. I remember. I love bread and I love pudding. Yeah, great. Put together, I should be good, right? That's one thing. I don't remember having it, so if I did have it, it might have been eh. Yeah. Well, like I tell you, I my my um my kid's uncle loves um rice pudding. Okay. Not a fan. He loves it. All right. He's always trying to get me, man. You got it. Come on, you got to try. I said I tried it years ago. in my bag. Try it now. Isn't the consistency kind of weird on yeah, that? Yeah, that's what I think it was with me. It was like yeah, just kind of yeah. weird all together. The mouth feel. Yeah, but that I know I don't like, but I don't remember a bread pudding. But you're right. I should like it because yeah. I like everything in it, I think. Bread and pudding. <laughs> How do you miss? <laughs> that checks both boxes for me. How do you miss? <laughs> Maybe you know what I'll do later? Maybe I'll go and because I don't want to ever, you know, violate banana pudding. Maybe I'll go get some snack packs. I love me some snack pack okay. when I was a kid. Give me some chocolate snack pack. I'll go get a loaf of bread. Maybe I'll mix Give it, it together. Shot. See what I got. I, I will say I can't eat chocolate pudding anymore. Really? I used to get medications mixed in them, and that oh, ruined pudding no, for me would, for a long absolutely time. Absolutely, it would. Because like it did mask the taste, but now like I associate like chocolate pudding with bitter tasting medicine, and I just I can't get past that mental block. Yeah, I would too. There's no doubt. I would be like, is there, is there medicine in here? I can't do this. I used to get the chocolate vanilla mix of snack pack. That's a good. I really like the mix. But if they were putting medicine in my pudding, yeah. it'd screw it up for me, too. I, but thank God they didn't put it in your banana pudding, sir. No, they did not. Again, I hadn't come around to banana pudding at that point in time. So that that that's really, honestly, the only pudding I've probably eaten in the past 8 to 10 years. Banana pudding? Banana pudding. 
uh, like I said, my 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 aunts, my grandma. That's they. I was eating banana pudding for dinner. You know, I'm sitting here really quick. We got oh, a couple it's, seconds. It's got fruit. It's it's healthy, right? <laughs> it's right. It's got bananas in it. All right. What is in bread pudding? Since we've been talking, we only got a few seconds here. We can't go well, another time. Bread for one. Okay. Bread pudding. Let's see what's in this baby. You know, in an hour number two, oh, Terry's going to make bread pudding. I'm going to make everyone. bread pudding on the live stream. I mean, man. Okay, ready? Where's it at here? Quick. We're, we got the music going. Oh, come on. 20 seconds. Raisins. Raisins are okay. You can leave raisins out of mine. Cinnamon. Uh, cinnamon. I like cinnamon. I take or leave raisins. Bread. Is there bread? Yes. Bread cubes. And we're running out of time. Cooking with Terry up next. <laughs>
Halftime show with uh, Terry Ford and Tyler Head here uh, on the game in Columbia, Florence, Myrtle Beach. Thanks for hanging out with us uh, today. We appreciate it. Football, football, football in the 1 o'clock hour, sponsored by Atlantic Windows and Doors. Here's a st- here, Let me ask you a question there, Tyler Head. All right. How much does seven and six in a pinstripe bowl loss to Rutgers, how much does that cost me if I'm the University of Miami in paying my head coach Mario Cristobal? Well, I'd hope not a lot because that's not really a great season in the grand scheme of things, especially considering what you hired Mario Cristobal away from Oregon to come there and do. It only going to cost you $22.7 million in total compensation. What a steal. Bargain. It's like, you know what, it's like going to Dollar Tree and finding those Cheetos. Little teeny bag of Cheetos for a dollar. Yeah, that you take two bites and they're gone. They're gone. Twenty-two point seven million in total compensation for Mario Cristobal. It were, let's see, eight million dollars in base pay. The rest of the money was quote other reportable compensation. Uh, let's see, University of Miami, according to USA Today, University of Miami paid football coach Mario Cristobal twenty-two point seven million. In 2022, including 7.7 million. Oh, so this was 2022, according to USA Today. 22.7 million, 7.7 in base pay, 14.7 million in other reportable compensation, according to the federal tax form released by the university on Tuesday. Because it always goes a year back, is when you get this stuff. You never get just this, you always get a year back from right, right. The, the, the previous year. So that was even worse been seven and six remember yeah um i need to seek some other reportable compensation part of it they said is let me find it here um part of that other pay is believed to have covered the nine million dollar buyout money that was owed to oregon okay so basically i guess cristobal paid it out uh, and, and they just and, reimbursed him right and then they reimbursed him so Someone offers you a job, you take it, and you got to buy out with the other place, and you end up getting paid the money back from the buyout anyway. So is it really a buyout? It's not. It's just it's a loan shifting money around. Yeah, that's all it is. Which I mean, most often, especially at a place like Oregon, which it's funny, it's happened a couple times now between him and Willie Taggart. Most of those places aren't expecting the coach to move on to a different job. They, I guess, almost had that happen with Dan Lanning, if you believe that he was in line to be the Alabama head coach mm-hmm. before they, you know, cut him that big old Nike check to stick around a little bit mm-hmm. longer. Um, but most of the time when we talk about buyouts, it's usually like, oh, we fired the coach. Now we got to pay him whatever's left remaining on that deal to mm-hmm. n- have him not coach here anymore. It, it's not usually the other way around when you're talking about high insti- high-end institutions like a place like Oregon. Guess how much the uh, president of the University of Miami makes Oh, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to say 900000 1.3. You did okay. You did okay. all right there. And the price is right. You would have been right there. Yeah, I'll be close. You might have been have a chance to win the showcase. Basketball coach Jim Larinaga, $2.6 million, which, yeah, makes sense. Athletic director uh, Dan Radakovich, who came from, obviously, from Clemson. Danny's making one point nine. Okay. So. All those together. Not even, not even Crystal Ball's salary. Yeah, not, not even, not even the eight million. Dent. So, I, 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 I've said this for a long time. If you can get to the upper echelon of college football coaching, you're going to be set. And if you can get fired from a Power Five institution, you never have to work no, no, work another day in your life. Dan Mullen is set for life, never coaching again if he needs, if he doesn't want to. Yeah, he's got his ESPN deal. That's probably good for. I don't know, a million or so, but if he just wanted to sit on a beach somewhere and not have to worry about mm-hmm. football for the rest of his life, the mm-hmm. money Florida paid him to go away would have him set forever. Sure. I mean, look at, I mean, Will Muschamp doesn't have to coach. No. In fact, anything. Will Muschamp finally just basically stepped into being the guy that watches film now, which he's which that's so excited about. Perfect for him. He's getting 30K at Georgia now yeah, to I be mean, an look, analyst. Look at Jimbo. Jimbo Fisher can go buy his own continent. Oh, yeah. Jimbo Fisher could walk to, like, you know, pick a continent. And go in and say, you know what? I like to buy you. I've always, I've always loved, I've always loved the African continent. I, I just, I, I, I love everything about it. Here, how, how many millions you want? And it's going to be Jimbo continent. He could buy you go to Australia. Hey yeah. guys, 
How much how much for naming rights of the continent? You know what you know what Jimbo should do? He should take that money. He should buy the naming rights to Kyle Field. Jimbo Fisher Field. Jimbo Fisher Field. Brett, you know what? Make a donation, a big donation, and it's now J- Jimbo Fisher Field, and you'll give Kyle something on the 50-yard line or whatever. Jimbo the, the, Fisher Field. The artist formerly known as the head football coach at the University of Texas, a- at Texas A&M University, Jimbo Fisher Field. That's a mouthful, but if I had that amount of money, I would do that. How funny would that be, by the way? Jimbo Fisher Field to remind everyone when you when you when you go to an A and M game. Oh, I would have the logo on the field, the whole his nine face, yards. His yes. face on the fifty yard line. How cool would that be? Just <laughs> anyway. a constant reminder of that uh, insane contract you gave him. Yeah. Jeez. I uh, speaking. Of, I, mean, I mean, look, Mario Cristobal. So far, Miami's twelve and thirteen in two years. Now, I always say you give a coach three years. I to agree. To be fair. And. We'll see what Mario Cristobal does. So far, it's been very underwhelming. He's been recruiting pretty well, but it hasn't translated on the field. The quarterback position has been, eh. Offensive coordinator choices have been, eh. Remember, we watched Justin Herbert at Oregon. Who was the head coach? Mario, Mario Cristobal. Cristobal. Yep. Nobody went, wow, look at Herbert in that offense at Oregon. No, it was like this. This guy's got all this physical talent. Why aren't they putting up more points at Oregon? Why aren't they more explosive on offense or splashy? Right. Then he got to the NFL, and you're like, "Oh wow! wow. Why was he doing this at Oregon?" Right. I, well, I remember that game. Bo Nix was a freshman, and they beat Justin Herbert in Oregon. And yeah, and that game was 12 years ago, and Bo Nix is just now going into yeah, the NFL. Exactly. 35 year old Bo Nix. Uh, so to me, Mario Cristobal. There's something in the offenses. I mean, he's been he was successful at Oregon, two double digit win seasons, had a couple not had a nine win year as well. So it's not like he hasn't had success, but offensively, even with the talent they've had on hand, you thought they would be better. And at Miami, they've struggled on offense for two years under Mario Cristobal. Well, and, and so. let's be honest here, the U had their day in the sun. Mm-hmm. They are not the powerful brand they once were in college football now a couple years ago mark rick had that 10 win season Mm -hmm. you know kind of looked like oh man the u's back but they've kind of fallen back to that middle to low tier in the acc like they existed for for a very long time as opposed to oregon that has always kind of been at the forefront the top of college football a little bit easier maybe to put recruits out there especially with nil and all that kind of stuff than what you have currently down in south beach but didn't Cristobal sell the whole world he would bring the U back and don't they have some money people there who are making it rain with the NIL that is true so I mean right now again patience but two years you got 12 and 13 and losing the epic pinstripe bowl to Rutgers you lost to Rutgers to be fair it was a home game for Rutgers that's true because they are new, they are New York City's oh, college uh, football the, team. The, the two things people talk about in the Bronx are the Yankees and Rutgers football. Who doesn't? I mean, when I was in New York City a few weeks ago, everywhere I looked, Rutgers gear. I, you know, you get on the subway, you lead the the, the fight song chant. No, oh, everybody it, knows it. I saw something really cool. Greg Schiano for mayor. It's pretty wild. I hear they're going to make a sequel to the uh, Bronx Tale. It's going to be a Piscataway Tale. <laughs> so, Mario Cristobal. Twenty-two point seven million in twenty twenty-two. Wow, that's crazy, just crazy. All right. Also, football, football, football. Sponsored by Atlantic Windows and Doors. Um, we're gonna get to some uh, Mazio Bennett sound here in just a little bit. The um, freshman wide receiver at South Carolina. We've been hearing a lot about Mr. Bennett in spring ball. Now, what, what will that translate to? I don't know, but we've heard his name. Um, in spring ball a few times from Shane Beamer about making some plays on offense. Wide receiver positions wide open. Yep. There's opportunity there. So we're going to hear some Mazio Bennett here in a couple minutes. And bottom of the hour, what an interesting read ESPN about Bill Belichick. We didn't get to it yesterday. This is very interesting. It says something about Bill Belichick. It says something about Robert Kraft. And it says something about why the Falcons suck. I look forward to this. Three things it tells me. 
We're going to get to that bottom of the hour. Up next, though, uh, some Azio Bennett sound. We'll hear from the freshman wide receiver, and we'll kind of get the idea of uh, where his mind is because he's had a good spring so far. Craft Beer Card is back. You can spend 30 bucks at 12 different craft beer locations. It's a $360 value, 30 times 12. You can get it for only $79. It's like Terrace. Sounds like a great deal. Love me some craft beer. Go to 1075thegame.com. Click on Sweet Deals. Get yourself a craft beer passport. And then you can go craft beer in all over the Midlands. We'll come back. Mazio Bennett yesterday talking to the media during spring practice. We'll get to that on the halftime show with Terry Ford, Tyler Head. Roll until three on the game.
Football, 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 one o'clock hour here on the game. Terry Ford, Tyler Head. Uh, coming up, uh, post game show. Jay still, uh, I tell you, it's, it's rough. It's a rough assignment, man. Sit there at Hilton Head at a golf tournament, covering the golf tournament. It's a rough go. Yeah, no, it's a tough life. Um, I, I, you know, Radio in general, it's such a tough life. We go to golf tournaments. We go to firehouse subs. We eat food for free. We go free. to you know Quaker Steak and Lube and have to bowl. Like this job is not easy. I always love in media people complain. <laughs> oh, especially about the free food, right? That's my favorite. I've always looked at it this way. We've gone to different places over my life of of, of doing sports, or really just radio in general. And you get fed food, and look. Some free food's better than others. Sure. But you know what's really good about food? It's free. When it's free. And the only thing I would whine about is they gave me free sauerkraut. Yeah. My hate of sauerkraut yeah. is, is a vile See, hate. I'm not even like a, I don't, I've never been a tomato person my entire life, right? Mm -hmm. So we start doing these shows at Firehouse. A lot of Firehouse subs come with tomatoes on them. Mm -hmm. It's a free sandwich. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm going right. to eat it as, as mm -hmm. is. And I'm like, it's tomatoes, sandwiches, not too bad. <laughs> So, Larry Chandler, thank you. You have not, uh, I'm not appalled by tomatoes anymore. Now, do you carry your um, specialty ketchup into a um, firehouse? Uh, I do not. The ketchup on firehouse subs is not a combination I believe is going to work out quite so well. Okay. Just checking on you. I mean, if you, I don't know if you need them for anything in firehouse. You just walk in with your uh, ketchup. I did, I did use some Heinz ketchup yesterday and immediately thought of our conversation <laughs> about my emergency <laughs> bottle that I used to take with me. Best story you've told in a year. Yeah, you never know. Best story you told here about you carrying ketchup in your in your vehicle. Because if I show up at your barbecue or your cookout and you got hunts, we're gonna or, have a problem. Or generic store brand. The water <laughs> with some tomato paste in there. No, thank you. Yes, I can taste the difference. Yes, you can. We're gonna do that on video. We're gonna blindfold you. I I can hunts, assure you I'll Heinz get it right. And store brand and see what you do. I can guarantee you I'll this. get it right. We are going to do this. I can look at it and tell you the difference. <laughs> it's, it's impressive and scary all at the same time. You know, uh, we all have our skills in life. Yes, we do. All right. So, uh, Maisie O'Bennett, freshman uh, wide receiver, talking to the media yesterday during the uh, player availability. All right. Here's Bennett. Again, there's opportunity in this wide receiver room. And here is Bennett uh, talking about his, let's start with cut 13, his welcome to college moment, Tyler. Uh, definitely is that uh, everybody plays special teams, regardless if that's kickoff, kickoff return, punt, punt return, everybody plays special teams. And I say my welcome to college moment was in the scrimmage that we had uh, in the stadium last week. I had to block Connor Cox on the front line. So that was a definitely a welcome to college moment. <laughs> Hold on. I'm curious about something because you and I were looking at uh... – uh, Maisie O'Bennett's measurables a little bit earlier on today. Uh, six foot, 165, and that may be generous for mm -hmm. being honest. Uh, okay, yeah, Connor Cox, 6'5", 227. That's a, a welcome to college there. moment. That's a welcome to college moment right there. No doubt. And that, that's when you're like, wow, these guys are big. Well, and, you know, Maisie O'Bennett, being a wide receiver, was – never the biggest guy on the field in high school. Right. You know, maybe, maybe on the bigger side for wide receivers, depending on, you know, who he's going against. But, you know, you had some heavy guys on defensive lines, mm -hmm. things like that. But, yeah, probably not somebody as big and athletic as a Connor Cox at tight end at 6'5", 227. Who runs the way he does for his size. Yes, yeah. to your point. Welcome to college, Mazio. All right, here's also uh, Mazio Bennett talking about his wide receiver coach, Coach Mike Furry, who obviously is, this is his first season as the wide out coach. Furry obviously play had, had some couple, once great year in the NFL, had two, maybe another uh, good year as well, hung out in the league for a bit. Furry started Ohio State. His journey took him other ways, ended up playing in the league. And here is uh, Bennett talking about uh, Coach Furry. Uh, coach for he's a he's a great guy you know what i'm saying uh dealing with two obviously with coaches in the past uh coach Steph, coach coley i mean coach fury he's he's here to stay you know what i'm saying and you can definitely feel that in that wide receiver room he teaches us and he he wants us to be great you know what i'm saying the more that he gets to know us the more comfortable he feel around us i feel like he's definitely growing into that that coaching role that we can trust him you know what i'm saying and he could trust us so i feel like coach coach Furry, he's he's definitely 
made me grow as a player. Uh, makes me want to go harder every day just because I know I got him in my ear telling me that I'm doing this good, but I also need to fix this as well. So just having him in my ear every day, that, that makes me feel comfortable being on the field. You know, till Bennett said it out loud, he's been around how many months? Uh, three, four? Yeah, something like that. He's had three wide receiver coaches. That's crazy. Think about that for a minute. Until he said it, I never thought about that. That wide receiver room was on their third wide receiver coach. Yeah, I know. And, and similar to, you know, the situation with Montero Hardesty, um, now you obviously did not fire Justin Stepp or anything like that. Like it was it was guys making their own moves that ultimately resulted um, and, you know, Coley going, going back to Georgia ultimately resulted in you having to hire Mike Ferry. So, um Mm -hmm. And that is a difficult situation, especially for a room like the wide receivers that brings in so many new guys that were committing to Justin Stepp initially back in December. Mm -hmm. And then, all right, well, here comes James Coley and a guy, again, guy that has prowess all over college football and the SEC and stuff like that. Okay, well, then he's gone after two weeks. And yeah. you bring in Mike Ferry, who, again, does have a, a good reputation, played in the NFL, where all these guys obviously are aspiring to go. And Again, from everything we've heard up to this point, it's it's been good. And Mazio Bennett seems to like him as well as the other guys. It, it's just and you think about, okay, you've had three wide receiver coaches in a room where you have all these transfer portal guys coming in. You got freshmen. You know, if there was any position on this football team besides the quarterback coach that you would want stability <laughs> in this offseason, what position <laughs> coach do you think it would be? Do you think they all need to wear name tags in the room still? The coaches have to wear name tags the way it's gone. But, for, I mean, I never, we've heard nothing but good stuff about Furry so far. Intense guy, obviously did play in the NFL. You know, his path, you know, like the transfer portal guys can, he can, you know, he has a way to kind of relate to them because right. he transferred. Sure. So, I like Bennett too. Furry ain't going anywhere. And, and look. He won the press conference when he was introduced and, yeah. and really talked about how he wanted to develop guys, what mm -hmm. his aspirations were as a wide receivers coach right here at South Carolina. Um, you know, And again, we take things that coaches say with a grain of salt, and rightfully so, because mm -hmm. they'll tell you they're not taking the job, and the next day they're gone taking that job. So mm -hmm. you always have to be weary, but I, I liked everything I heard from him. Well, too, he said, I, and I like this now. I feel like coaching, I'm not saying everyone's going this way, it feels like you hear this more and more now of we're focusing on the player's strengths. Let's focus on what the player can do. Let's focus on um, the things the player can be successful at. Instead of saying this is the way I coach receivers, this is the way I want receivers to be, this is the way you're going to be. Well, I can't do it. You will. Trust me. Yeah. I mean, you always it, want to coach deficiencies to make someone better. Sure. But it, I think I like it, coaching now to where they're also saying, you know, here's what he does well. While we work on the stuff he doesn't, let's put him in position yeah. to succeed by scheming up the stuff that he can do. Plus, that will give him more confidence. Sure. And we get a better player moving forward. Yeah, it doesn't always have to be the my way or the highway type of approach. So, well, if you can't do it the way that I want you to do it, then you can't do it type thing. You do have to, especially, again, with – the variety of talent that you have in something like South mm -hmm. Carolina's wide receiver room now with everybody coming in from the portal in addition to guys that are coming in for another year like Harbor and mm -hmm. Tashawn Russell that you do have to adapt to their skill sets to to make it better the, the best for everyone. Let's get cut 12 uh, Tyler. Uh, Mazio Bennett talking about uh, what he's learned the first few months on the team. Honestly, it's been better than I could have ever imagine. Uh, just being able to grasp the concepts as fast as I've been able to do it, I feel like that's something that I can pride myself on since I've been able to come in. I, I take studying serious, you know what I'm saying? Just because the more that you know, the faster that they can put you on the field. So I started to learn that and just learning the concepts and what I have to do, when I have to do it, the time and other play with the quarterback to read, stuff like that. That's just been, it's been amazing to be able to grasp the concepts. Stuff you got to learn. There's a lot of concepts and systems. And, you know, and college, obviously, it's up a level from high school with all of the terminology and, and, and the offenses are getting more complex. But just think when you get to the NFL, what yeah, it's like. For sure. I mean, if you're a wide receiver, you got to learn how to read coverages. You got you to gotta look at a defensive backfield and look at the uh, DB that's covering you. And there's things you got to look at. And you and the quarterback got to be on the same page. Because your route could adjust depending on the coverage 
of what's being called. So it, wide receiver, there is there is a lot of mental things you have to figure out. It's not just, yeah, the number one thing is beat your guy. Get open. When they throw it to you, catch it. But there are some things you've got to do to help you get open by looking at what the defense is doing to you as a wide receiver or the passing offense. Yeah, and from and again, this is a guy that most of of us have not seen play in person unless you were going to his high school games. But from everything that Wes and Chris, you know, tout about him coming in as a recruit, that it's very smart, just a good overall wide receiver. Again, not, and not doesn't have the size that's going to intimidate you, but is very efficient at the wide receiver position. And, and from what we've heard through the first couple of weeks of practice, he's somebody that is making a lot of noise. Now, does that mean he's going to be – a starter in game number one? No, but he could be somebody that could contribute for you quite a bit this upcoming season. I will right, get back in here. Football, football, football. Sponsored by Atlantic Windows and Doors. This deep dive into Bill Belichick's offseason, very interesting. It told me things about Belichick, about the Robert Kraft and the Patriots. I'll throw a new one in. The hiring process in life and the Falcons. We'll get into that coming up. Football, 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 the 1 o'clock hour, sponsored by Atlantic Windows and Doors. It's a halftime show here on The Game.
We are rolling football, football, football in the halftime show here on the game. Terry Ford, Tyler Head, and of course, football, 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 always sponsored by our friends in Atlantic Windows and Doors. So I, I got a chance to read what is just a very interesting deep dive. Look, I love Don Van Natta and Seth Wickersham, and Jeremy Fowler was part of this as well. But their, their writing is so good. And remember, they used to do all that investigative stuff for ESPN. Right. But their, their writing is excellent, so it's well-written. But just going through Bill Belichick's offseason and why he didn't get a gig. And part of it, well, there's, more, there's many parts to this. Here's a guy who has won eight Super Bowls as a head coach. Mm -hmm. Run that through your head. And the ones, and they lost the one against the Eagles that they could have won. Remember, that was a shootout. It was, it went down to the very end. Yep. Undefeated, had the ball against the Giants with a chance to win that one. Then lost the other one to the Giants in a game that was, I believe, a one-score game, if my memory serves me. Mm -hmm. So this guy couldn't get a gig. And your thought is, that's ridiculous. And partly, is it? Yeah. Because... <laughs> In some ways, if you're, if you're, I want to be really nice here, if you're a dumpster fire of an organization and you couldn't spell winning if they gave you the double, the U, the I, both ends, the I and the other end, this is a guy that knows winning. Yeah. This guy, this guy, this guy sweats winning. Sure. I would, I would, despite any of these other things we're going to talk about, I might still say, dude, here are the keys. You you know winning we don't we're gonna give this a shot we've tried other things and and it's gone it's been a wreck here we're gonna give the ultimate winner the keys to the to, to the uh, organization right but nobody wanted to do that and part of it is what's happened to Belichick since Brady left Belichick's age. Mm -hmm. Belichick, the way he handled offense after Brady left. You mean giving his defensive coordinator the offense? When you give the offense to Joe Judge and Matt Patricia and say they're going to run your off, really? But Matt Patricia has a backwards hat and a pencil behind his ear. Yeah. I thought he was a NASA engineer. Yeah, and he's got all that food in his beard. That screams offensive genius. And the other thing is, and this, this is not a surprise. According to this article, there are people that say Robert Kraft didn't do Bill any favors. Right. No matter how good, here's, here's the lesson about job hunting, and this goes, this goes away from Belichick. Here's a guy whose resume screams, you don't need to check my references, right? Right. You look at that resume, if you like, you're, you're, you're a headhunter, you're in management at your company, and you get this guy's resume, Bill Belichick, on your desk. Right. You're almost like, I don't need to check these references. The guy's phenomenal. But in the NFL and in life, people call and just talk. Hey, man, um, this guy worked for you. Can you tell me about him? Yeah, here's what, I, here's what happened when he was with me. Thank you. And that's not the reference, because the smart people don't call the references on the paper. Right. They look for other, because if I'm going to put down three references, am I going to put down people who are going to dog me? No, it's people that are going to speak the best of you, glowing reviews, right. all that stuff. Here's my, here's my reference. You're not going to call my reference. <laughs> that guy sucks. He's lazy, comes in late all the time. The halitosis is something awful. No, you're going to put down references that are going to talk you up. Right. But Arthur Blank talked to, because really the, the one job Bill Belichick legitimately had a chance for was in Atlanta. And it seemed like it was going to be a done deal. It was. I mean, there was talk about D.C., but Josh Harris, who now owns the Washington football team, liked the model of strong GM in the pecking order over the coach. Right. Because, you know, Josh Harris has won so many championships. Sure. Of course his model works. Uh, but that's a model he, he wants to take along that he's had in the NBA and NHL. There was a, a minute conversation, maybe about Charlotte, but Bill Belichick would kill David Tepper within 30 seconds. Yeah, that, that dynamic wouldn't last very long. Now, the minute, the minute 
the temper comes in and goes, I drew up a really cool play on my napkin when I was sitting at um, at Chili's. Could you put that in the offense? Bludgeon him to death. That's Pro what would happen. Probably. Philadelphia was closer than you would think because the Eagles like Belichick, mm -hmm. and there's a good relationship there. But again, we'll get into it that other side in a minute why that wouldn't I mean, Sirianni think about the guy's record and there's thoughts of getting rid of him I know it's craziness insane. so that really the timing was off on that one in some ways now if this was next year and Sirianni's Eagles struggle and let's say they're five and seven at some point then you could see him kicking Sirianni to the curb interim head coach and then go hiring a new guy so really, when it all played itself out, one place was the place that was Atlanta. Since that Super Bowl, what happened to that Super Bowl? We all know. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Yes, um, they, they, they have made one playoff appearance since then. And, it just, it, and, and they haven't been consistently good in a long time. They had a few years of Matt Ryan where they were consistently either in the playoffs or fighting for playoff spots, to be fair. Right. But, again, it's the Falcons. And so you look at an organization, I'm not going to say the polar opposite of New England, but not what you call having large runs of success. You're looking to get yourself kick-started now. You want to get good. You want to be a perennial playoff contender. There's one guy out there that knows the way, Bill Belichick. Now, Arthur Blank meets with Belichick, and according to this article, Blank walked away from that first meeting feeling really good about possibly hiring Belichick. Then there's a second interview with Blank and the upper-level management guys, right. including your favorite guy, Richie McKay, yes, Terry Fontenot, and another member of the inner circle of Arthur Blank. That's when it turned. It's very simple. Why it turned? Those guys didn't want to lose their jobs. They didn't want to lose their power. They didn't want to lose their influence. They don't care what was best for the Falcons. They care about what was best for themselves. Now, maybe those guys are delusional thinking what's best for the Falcons is them, which I think they've established is not what's best for the Falcons is them. Right. Especially McKay. So I think once Blank had the interview with Belichick with his, his management guys, they started to poison it yeah for their own self for their own self-interest right and this is why the falcons suck right there this is why i'm not disagreeing with you and arthur blank god love him he's a nice man he for a man who's a bazillionaire he's also easily influenced by others around him he doesn't like confrontation doesn't like controversy he's not pushing back on these cats right and so long story short raheem morris gets the job who, by the way, let's check the resumes. Now, here's where Belichick's at fault. We've covered the Falcons. And Robert Kraft, again, this is one of the reasons Belichick's at fault. You know, because Belichick, according to the, this is not a shock. Ready for this? You're going to take a minute. Belichick is very arrogant. To say the least. Belichick is very smart. He's very set in his ways. He's not a people person. Now, when you're, if you're the Crafts and you've been with Belichick for this long, an abrasive type personality who's also arrogant, is that going to wear on you? Probably. Yes. So Belichick's reputation doesn't help him of the person that he is. Also, Kraft, and they won't admit this, but Kraft wasn't saying glowing things about Belichick when Arthur Blank called. He basically said, according to this article, don't trust Belichick. Yeah. He's not trustworthy. Arthur Blank, look, anybody wants trust with, with their top people. Of course. Not just Arthur Blank. Well, and Arthur Blank's been stabbed in the back by non-trustworthy coaches before. Right. Uh, <coughs> by Vitrino. So I get that is a huge red flag, but this goes back to Bill. Because of your arrogance and the way you are, where you don't think it's important to have relationships with people because you're so bleeping successful, right. that's fine when you're bleeping successful, but now when you haven't had any success over the last few years, now guess what? Wow, you're really not friendly. You're not a people person. You're kind of arrogant. Yeah. It, yeah. It's kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, when you get 
you have the popular people in high school, right? Mm -hmm. That when they're in the, the setting of high school, you know, they're the cheerleader, the football player, whatever it is, and everybody loves them because they're in that setting. But as they get out of high school and they're still trying to clean back mm -hmm. to what those high school days were, you're like, ah, they're not really that great of a person. I didn't, <laughs> I don't really want to be friends with them anymore. You know what I mean? Because they're still relying on what they did years and years ago to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. They're and, 30 years old wearing their varsity jacket. And again, if Phil Belichick goes out there and wins the Super Bowl with Mac Jones, we're not having this conversation. It's like, well, this guy can win with anyone. Bring him on in. And that's where the age comes in because you haven't been successful for three or four years and you're in your 70s. Right. Like, and I think that's a perfect, what you said's perfect. If Mac Jones with Belichick make a Super Bowl run and then New England and Bill Park Company, Bill has a job right now. Oh, Bill would have been the first one off the board. Even if they've been a perennial playoff team since Brady left, Bill's got a job right now. The age doesn't matter. Sure. It's what's happened since Brady left that has stained him and the person that he is. He's not evolved, and that's hurt him. A guy that used to be evolving all the time was one step ahead of the curve. He thought the quarterback was like any other player. Right. So very interesting read in ESPN. All right, we'll come back. Firehouse subtext the hour at 803-404-6100 is next on the Halftime Show with Terry Ford and Tyler Head on the game.
halftime show, halftime show. I want his voice. You were just... The voice guy. I wanted halftime show. He's just so much better than... You were just doing your best impersonation. Yeah, and you know, he's got a cool halftime show voice. And I like a song, a 12-year-old boy gargling razor blades. It's just, it's not fair. All right, Firehouse Sub Text the Hour, 803-446-100. What do you got there, my friend? Uh, yeah, James weighs in and says, I hope Bennett is as good of a player as he is an interview. Hard to believe he's a true freshman. I'll say this. Not a lot of guys come in with uh, moxie behind the microphone as true freshmen. A lot of them very reserved. Don't want to say a whole lot. So I, I was pretty impressed by what we heard from Mazio Bennett yesterday. Yeah, I, I agree with the texter. I mean, he he was very, very comfortable. Was had a little polish to him. Doesn't sound like your typical 18-year-old in front of a microphone. Dylan Stewart, on the other hand, eh, a little bit more a, quiet. Man, man a few yes, words. And man that's a okay. few words. That's, that's okay. okay. Just go out there and, and knock the hell out of quarterbacks, man. That's, that's right. Don't care what you say when you're in front of microphones. But let me again. You see it. You see it. You know the pro level, the collegiate level. It's just some guys are much more comfortable in front of a microphone. They like talking. Some guys don't want any part of it. It, it would amaze people. I'm not here to out anybody, but we have a lot of athletes that come through here for the Garnet Trust Hour, things like mm-hmm. that, where they sit in the studio with us and talk for an hour, basically. And, and again, you're just talking into a microphone. We're there bouncing back and forth, asking questions, and stuff like that. And the amount of ones that are nervous mm-hmm. to talk publicly. At, they, they can go out on the court, a uh, baseball diamond, football field, and they're just the baddest dude on the planet. Mm-hmm. But they get in here in front of a microphone, and it's like, uh, I don't know what to do. Yeah, and there's, there's a, there, you know, it, usually it's comfort level. Two, you got this thing in front of your face. Hey, just yeah. talk and be natural. Yeah. And Or three, they're scared they're going to say something that's going to screw them over. It's that's usually one point. of those three buckets. Sure. And... And some of them do come in; they're more comfortable. Some of them you just, some of them you sit and what you, you'll kind of maybe ask them questions not about sports. Hey man, uh, what are you listening to uh, on Spotify? Hey, uh, what are you streaming? Hey, whatever. Uh, what favorite well, we, podcast? Hey, we always talk food. Well, and then they'll get them going on food, and then they get more comfortable because now they're just shooting the crap with everybody, right? Right. Well, that's the other part too. The and the media look; it's lightened up over the years, but it's still basically. A Q and A, sure. With the media, like you know, you sit down with these pressers, and they're gonna ask you a question. You're gonna answer. They ask you a question. You answer it. So when you get in this situation here, like we do in the Garner Trust, they think here we go Q and A with the media, right? Mm-hmm. Why don't you start talking about food, favorite vacation place, um, well, yeah, favorite milkshakes, whatever? Now they're just talking with a bunch of dudes, right? Right. right. And they get more comfortable. But some some will come in and just go, like Oscar Attaway. My man could have filled up the whole day. He, he, I, I'm I still uh, I still want to get Robbie Ashford in here. I, we oh. may only we may we may only have to ask him like four questions the entire hour. Robbie Ashford was great and very honest. And, and again, for our for purpose of our business, we love talkative and honest. We love no filter, as long as you don't cuss. That's right. We love we love you. If you just let it all, like Ashford, man, nobody's developed me. <laughs> nobody's worked on making me a better quarterback. You're like, all righty. Very nice. Hugh Freeze, yeah. Brian Harson, yeah. Cristobal and his staff, yeah. But Robbie was very upfront with. Maybe we could ask Robbie, hey, you think Cristobal deserved $22.7 million, million. <laughs> million dollars at Miami? Uh, that would be a good question. So, Mario Cristobal bagged $22.7 million his first year in Miami. Is he worth it? That answer might be fun. Might be a few minutes. Yeah. So, I, I agree with the, with the texter about uh, Mazio Bennett. Very, very good. Very. And he was, like, interesting in what he was saying. Oh, very yeah. interesting. Totally. So, yeah, I, we agree. And thank you for the text on the uh, Firehouse subtext at 803-446-100. We've been talking a lot of football, football, football in the 1 o'clock hour. That's what we do as we talk football, football, football in the 1 o'clock hour here on the Halftime Show. And we want to thank our buds at Atlantic Windows and Doors for uh, always sponsoring a lot of football conversation. 
And real quick, we don't have much time because we're getting ready to pop one out of here. Is that the Browns, I want to get this piece in real quick. They do expect Deshaun Watson to be ready for the opener. Okay. We'll see. But they do expect Deshaun Watson to be good to go. Well, at least, you know, that's according to Andrew Barry, the GM. Now, remember, it was in November Watson had season-ending surgery. Yep, and Joe Flacco, they dug, they dug him up and played some good football. He had some really good moments. Again, he had some he had some Joe Flacco moments, but he also had some really good moments. And Cleveland ends up in the playoffs. And no one thought the Browns would make the playoffs once they started skimming for quarterbacks. Right. We'll see what Deshaun Watson does. He had a couple of... He had that really good game against the Ravens last year before he got hurt. But let's be honest. He has to wear a ski mask and, and drive a getaway car when he gets paid. He's That's stealing true. money in Cleveland. Right. We'll see what happens this upcoming year because, you know what, that gear, that contract, by the way, is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So he will be the Cleveland Browns starting quarterback no matter what. All right, uh, we'll come back in here. What's trending at 2, sponsored by Traditions Fine Jewelry and Gamecock Traditions. That's next on the halftime show in the game.
Halftime show, Terry Ford, Tyler Head, what's trending at two here on uh, the halftime show, sponsored by Traditions Fine Jewelry and Gamecock Traditions. All right, Tyler, we have a big uh, big baseball series coming up this weekend. Friday, 645, pregame, 7 o'clock, first pitch. Then Saturday, I believe it's 245 pregame, 3 o'clock, first pitch, yep. followed by the spring game. And then also Sunday baseball as well as South Carolina takes on Arkansas, number two team in the country. If you look at D2 baseball, was number one, got leapfrogged by A&M. And, you know, I'm looking at this right now. Look at the D1 baseball top 25. Uh, number one team in the country, Texas A&M. Number two is Arkansas. Number three is Kentucky. Number four is Tennessee. What do they all have in common? The uh, SEC teams. Yipper. So, and who does South Carolina play after the Arkansas series? Uh, Kentucky. Yep, they do. All right, so Mark Kingston was on Carolina Calls last night. And we'll start with Mark. Uh, The big story right now is Will Tippett, the shortstop who was scuffling at the plate while switch hitting. Finally, you know, Mark and the staff kind of pulled over Will, had a little come to to batting Jesus with him and saying, look, dude, we're going to, just hit right-handed. You hit much better right-handed. We're just going to go with it. No more switch hitting. Just for right now, we're going to abandon you at the left side of the plate. Since then, Tippett's taken off. Offense is night and day. Here's uh, Coach Kingston talking about Will Tippett's improvement. Feels like it's night and day. Uh, I think for the coaches, for the players, for for the fans, I'm sure watching, it feels like when he walks to the plate now, something good has a chance to happen, and it has. Uh, ever since he went to just right-handed and, and and stopped the switch hitting, he's been able to focus on one side instead of splitting his time and his work and his prep. Uh, and he's been a much better player. Right-handed is his natural side, and he's just been much better at the two homers, the two doubles, a lot of walks. Uh, he's he's been a weapon now all of a sudden, and when he gets on base he can steal bases as well so uh, him doing him being willing to, to go ahead and, and you know you got to swallow your pride a little bit because when you try to be a switch hitter and it's not going the way you want you've got to swallow your pride and just say okay I'm going to take a step back get to my natural side and do what's best for the team he's done that and it's been great for him and for us yeah I mean usually the switch hitters they hit much better left-handed than right-handed because they're seeing so much more right-handed pitching right but with Will Tippett you know, it's he's just better right-handed hitter. Yeah, and Coach Kingston talked, expanded on that a little bit. You know, he himself was a switch hitter back in college, and, you know, he said it's obviously not an easy thing to do. There's only a handful of great switch hitters in the history of Major League Baseball because it's such a rare thing to try and accomplish. Not saying that Will Tippett can't be a good switch hitter, but they were obviously saying it was not working trying to do two things at once. So it's mm-hmm. like, okay, well, let's cut this level of focus in half here. Just focus on your natural position, which is hitting right-handed, and let's see what happens there. And, again, going into this past weekend series against Florida, he had one multi-hit game the entire season. He's had three in the past four games now. It is. it is, And, and you know, Mark said it was night and day, and there's just the confidence level for him, for Will Tippett. So much of this stuff's from the neck up, man. At confidence it level. Just is. And, and look, it's, he's not going to get – he's not going to do two for three or, or three for five in every single game going forward, but having more consistent hitting – at your nine hole leading into the top of your lineup, which is already really good. How much, how well can that bode for this team going forward as you're getting set to play your toughest competition over these next couple of weeks? Yeah, if, if Tippett becomes productive and you put him and you keep him in the nine spot, you have a double leadoff hitter situation. Yes. So it, it's been it, like wow to see the difference in Tippett since he abandoned uh, switch hitting. Uh, and then that home run against the Citadel was end up being the game winning run. That's right. In a four three victory. Which again, he had two home runs going into the weekend in Gainesville. Mm-hmm. He hit one there and hit one on uh, Tuesday against the Citadel. All right, uh, Coach Kingston also on Carolina calls last night gave his scouting report of Arkansas. Uh, Razorbacks obviously number two team in the country have been good from the big first pitch of the season. Cut twenty four Tyler the scouting report from Coach Kingston on the Razorbacks. Well, they're the best pitching staff in the country. Uh, statistically, professional prospect-wise, it's the best pitching staff in the country. So we're going to have to really, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have to maybe be creative. We're going to maybe have to play more contact hitters as opposed to more power hitters. We're going to have to see if we can get a bunt down and maybe they'll throw one away. We might have to start some runners and think about hitting runs and running hits. Uh, just going to have to get a little creative because their pitching staff just is very stingy. They have 443 strikeouts and 316 innings. Opponents hit less than 
than 200. It's a real pitching staff. It's it's the best in the country right now. So uh, coming into Founders Park, we're going to have to really dig deep. We're going to have to get creative and uh, make sure we better have short swings this weekend because if you have long swings against this kind of pitching staff, uh, it could be for a long night. Terry, let me ask you a question here because sure. he's right. They do have the best pitching staff in the entire country. If South Carolina leaves 28 runners stranded over the course of three games this weekend, are they winning the series? No. 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 You see, that, that Florida series, and look, this does not take anything away from South Carolina offensively over the weekend against Florida. The Arkansas pitching staff and the Florida pitching staff. Couldn't be more different. Yeah. Uh, the Arkansas pitching staff. <sighs> Arkansas pitching staff throws a lot of strikeouts. Hayden Smith is, Hagen Smith, rather. Hagen Smith is, we'll talk about, we'll break it down in a minute looking at him in the big picture, but Hagen Smith of Arkansas, a lefty, is top shelf stuff. Here's uh, Coach Kingston. Let's get a uh, cut 19 about Hagen Smith. Well, we haven't gotten into that yet. We, uh, you know, the best coaching staff, we started looking at them today. Uh, last, this, earlier this week, the, the total focus was on the Citadel. You've got to put one game at a time, as the cliche goes. Uh, we put our focus this first half of the week into winning that game at the Citadel. So we started digging into to Arkansas today, and then we will start tomorrow addressing that with our players. And then obviously on game day, we do a full scouting report for our players. But when you look at Hagen Smith, it's, he will be the first college pitcher you're taking in the, in the major league draft this this year um, there's no question about that he's a big strong physical lefty 89 strikeouts and 47 innings and he's only given up 22 hits so to have four times as many strikeouts as hits it's almost unheard of at any level and so it's we're gonna have our hands full that night so we're gonna have to try to get creative try to do some things to maybe you know create runs in maybe ways that we haven't normally just to try to see if we can find something to get him off his game and so We'll see what we can come up with, and uh, we'll go from there. Now, I'm sitting here. Look, Hagen Smith will be a top 10 pick unless yeah. unless his asking price is so sideways that he'll fall down the draft board on signability issues. He'll be a top 10 pick. Right now, if I'm looking at Keith Law from The Athletic. He used to, you know, do the minor league draft evaluation stuff for ESPN. Now he's with The Athletic. He has Chase Burns of Wake Forest sixth overall right-handed pitcher. Hagen Smith, lefty from Arkansas, seventh. So, depending on what you like, Chase Burns or Hagen Smith are the top two college pitchers, you know, coming out of this draft. Basically, we're saying Hagen Smith is no joke. M- up, massive upside stuff. So, here's some numbers for you. Has the uh, best ERA in the entire country. Mm-hmm. Has lowest batting average allowed in the entire country. Um, he's pitched 47 innings and only giving up 22 hits. So that's less than half of a hit per inning pitched so far this season. 89 strikeouts, which is uh, fourth overall in the nation. He's the only pitcher in the top 10 nationally to have uh, that many strikeouts uh, with less than 50 innings pitched. This dude is a machine. It reminds me of Paul Skeens last year. And Skeens is right-handed. That's exactly what I brought up earlier on this morning. And South Carolina found a way to hit him. They got that, him. That was his, one of his worst outings of the entire year last year. And, again, you've lost some pieces from that team, obviously, so it's a little bit different, but it's possible. Well, Ethan Petrie took Skeen's yard last year. Yes, he did. And that Ethan, was, I think, had he not given up a home run the entire I think he hadn't given up a home run. first home run he had given season. up. Yeah. Um, and South Carolina ended up winning that game, um, you know, against LSU here at uh, Founders Park. That's another thing, too. This Arkansas team is much different on the road. They are unbeatable at home. They've mm-hmm. lost one game out of – by the way, their schedule's benefited them of playing a lot of home games so far this year. Mm-hmm. They played six true road games, three at Auburn and three at um, Alabama this past weekend. They lost that series at Bama. Lost that series to Bama. Mm-hmm. They're five and four away from Fayetteville. And their numbers, their numbers are still really good, but a little less when they head on, head on the road. So if you're heading out to Founders Park this weekend, you could play as big a role as the guys on the field in helping South Carolina win this game. Create a rowdy atmosphere, make them uncomfortable because they're not in Fayetteville. Right. And there's been a lot of trouble on the road in general in the in uh, the SEC this year. Right. And Arkansas, again, as good as they are, to your point, and, and, they've also struggled a bit on the road. And here's the thing. Their offense is it's okay. They scored nine runs the other night against mm-hmm. Texas A&M, but over the course of the final 25 innings against Alabama, they scored three runs. Yeah. Like, it, it's so – it's hit or miss. Yeah, and that pitching staff is the calling card. Yeah. Well, it, it's very much like a uh, – 
Mets a few years ago with DeGrom, mm -hmm. where dude's going to go out there and throw a gym. He'll allow a run or two, and the Mets lose the game one to nothing. Exactly. Maybe yeah. not that extreme, but, but, but similar. You're saying. But similar. The, the DeGrom stuff, sometimes you have such a high-level pitcher. I don't know if the I don't know if offensively you just go, ah, don't worry about it. This guy's on the mound. We're good. We'll yeah. have to score a couple runs. Or, or if you let down, I don't know, but you, you'll see from time to time dominant starting pitchers who get no run support at all. Right. It's really strange. Real quick, before we leave this idea, Keith Law, um, in ranking the uh, draft or the prospects for 2024, the MLB draft, to the shock of no one, Charlie Condon, Georgia, is a top-rated uh, prospect. Dude's a freak. Number three, uh, number two, number four, rather, is Jack Caglione from Florida. Number seven is Hagen Smith of Arkansas. So three, uh, three of the top seven, well, four of the top eight, Braden Montgomery, the outfielder, right-handed pitcher from A&M, is eighth. So four of the top eight players are from, uh, from the SEC. Two Wake Forest guys in the top six with Chase Burns. Nick Kurtz, the first baseman at Wake, is ranked number three overall. So just a little interesting little tidbit there. All right, um, Coach Kingston, we'll get one more cut from Mark before we move on out of here. Talking about this past week, starting with that A&M game, that Sunday win over A&M, here's Coach Kingston talking about the past week. Well, I'll even take it further back than that. I thought last week was about as good a week as you can have in college baseball, and it started last Sunday. Uh, we beat the now number one team in the country, Texas A&M, uh, beat them on Sunday. Then we traveled to Charlotte to play North Carolina in the AAA ballpark. North Carolina is now a top 10 team and one of the better teams we've seen this year. We beat them on Tuesday night. And then we traveled to Gainesville, and we won on Friday. We won on Saturday, let the one slip away on Sunday. But in terms of the overall week to beat Texas A&M, North Carolina, Florida twice in the same week was about as good a week as we've had in a while, but I think it's about as good a week as anybody in the country can have. So I was really proud of the guys. They're playing hard. They're playing well. There's still some areas that we want to continue to improve that if we do, then we're going to be an even better ball club. Uh, but I think o overall, that was a great week. Week and and it, uh, as you mentioned, it ended in Gainesville where I thought we played really well, especially offensively. It was one of our better weeks in a while. All right, eight and seven in the SEC, 26 and 11 overall. You did get the sweep of Andy at home. You've you've had some, whoa, what's up with that? Like at Alabama, the loss of Georgia Southern. It feels like that folks... When you give that record, folks will go, they're that good? Mm -hmm. They're really that good? Because it feels like just the perception is they're not, they're, they're, they're solid, they're above average, but when you see the record, you go, oh, they're that good? Yeah. And I think that's just, I feel like that's a perception that you get from folks when you talk to them about South Carolina baseball. It, it is, and I was, you know, looking at the D1 baseball field of 64 projections for this week, and they got South Carolina, much like last year, slotted in as the 15th seed, once again hosting a regional. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you'd obviously like to be in the top eight, where if you mm -hmm. theoretically won, you'd be hosting a super, but, like, you're right where you need to be. All your goals are still in front of you if you continue to hopefully put together a good second half of SEC play. You're not having to overcome some insurmountable odds of like, oh, no, we're, you know, two and seven in conference play or something like that. Like, you're in a good spot. Yes, your competition level is about to step up significantly over these next couple of weeks, but you can still accomplish everything you set out to accomplish. Yeah, remember, we said in, this nine, in the, in the nine-game SEC run you're going to have of Florida, Arkansas, Kentucky – if you walk out of that thing no worse than four and five, that that's that that thumbs up. Sure. But if you can do better than that, wow. But well, you already won two out of three. Yep. And that was in Gainesville. Which so, you hadn't done in over ten years. Yes. And right now, RPI wise, to the point we're trying to make South Carolina's thirteenth in the RPI. Is that the end all be all? No, but it's a top fifteen RPI team as well. So Yeah. yeah. It's better than you think, I guess is what I'm saying. Your next few opponents are also in the top 15 in the RPI, oh, by the they're, way. They're way... With the, Kentucky, exception, with the exception of Missouri. Kentucky's third, Arkansas's fourth. Uh, I think Georgia's 10th, Tennessee's in there too. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so Tennessee's won seven straight. Yeah. All right, halftime show. We'll continue on with trending at two next here on the game.
What's trending at two? Sponsored by Traditions Fine Jewelry and Gamecock Traditions. Official NIL partner with the Gardner Trust is Gamecock Traditions. All right, so a few stories here real quick. And we didn't get to this yesterday. Toronto Raptors, Jonte Porter has been banned from the league because he's just not that bright. That's a good way to put it. An investigation revealed he had disclosed confidential information to bettors, limited his participation in at least one game while he's with the Raptors so he could hit a prop bet and bet on NBA games while he's playing the G League. And God knows what else. Probably, probably, we were talking about this earlier. There's people thinking he was betting at Missouri. And when you sit and you look at this, well, there's a couple things that hit you. All right, the NBA's investigation found that Porter revealed information about his own health to a known sports better ahead of a March 20th game against Sacramento. Another better privy to information uh, placed an $80,000 same-day parlay that featured unders on Porter's stats that would win $1.1 million. I just... The, the money that, that the bets range from $15 to 22000 You look at all this... Compared to a, a an NBA career, Tyler, it's not worth it. Here's my thing. Here's my thing. Because because this consistently happens with all these gambling stories, whether it be this one, whether it be what happened with Bohan in Alabama, Calvin Ridley, you know, when he got suspended by the NFL and all that kind of stuff. It's like they don't think about the red flags they're putting off. Mm -hmm. When you are a player that most people have no clue exists in the NBA. And suddenly your prop bets are the highest on random nights during the season, beating out like superstar players. Something's fishy there. Ready? Smell. Yeah. Smell that? You don't yeah. you, you you don't think that these sports books and these companies have people that are specifically looking for these kind of oddities within mm -hmm. betting to flag and see what's going on? And that's how they all get caught. It's always a really stupid smoking gun. Like the thing with Bohannon last year. When we first heard the story, we're like, okay, this is stupid. Mm -hmm. Something dumb had to have happened for him to get caught. And sure enough, it was his buddy waving his phone around <laughs> the sports book saying, I got inside information on Alabama baseball. Look, I'm talking to the coach. I, I know the coach. Brian exactly. Bohannon. Hey, but where's that camera? See? Brian Bohannon. Exactly. Same thing here. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like, are you not? Mm -hmm. smart enough to do a little bit more cloaking. You know what I mean? Yeah, it just... Does it come down to brains? Does it come down to arrogance? Does it come down to, like you said, oh, nobody's paying attention? Everybody's... Pay they are... That is their job is to pay attention. Because you know what they don't like to do? Lose, Lose money. money. <laughs> exactly. The house always wins. And it just... It's like, well, dude, you blew... You could have made millions of dollars as a jobber in the NBA. And that's the thing about NBA contracts. They're fully guaranteed. If you're riding the bench... For eight years in the NBA, you're set for life. You're making millions. And now guess what? You're done. Yeah. I hope you're really good at this betting thing because it might be what you got left because you just screwed up an NBA career. And this works perfect for the NBA because it gives them their patsy to set an example of. Exactly. And, and look, you know, people bring up people bring up the point, and rightfully so, that sports leagues have done a 180 when it comes to gambling sure. mm -hmm. because 10, 12 years ago, not even mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's no way the NFL is doing a deal with BetMGM or DraftKings or whatever. Then they realize, hey, we make a lot of money off this. Okay, we're going to change our attitude. Mm -hmm. But they've still been very steadfast. And I know that every professional organization is bringing in professionals and bringing in people telling the players, here's what you cannot do. Mm -hmm. You can bet on things not involving this sport, not involving games that you play. You want to bet on an NFL game as an NBA player? Go for it. Mm -hmm. Do it. You just can't do it within the walls of the team's facility or whatever, right. which I feel like that's not hard to do. They are clearly are outlining what you can and can't do, and these guys still are breaking the rules. It's just, again, it's stupidity, arrogance, a mix of both. Oh, nobody's paying attention to me. Uh, the NBA got lucky here with this guy's a jobber. Yeah. Not trying to be mean. He's Michael Porter's brother. Right. Um, his younger brother plays at Pepperdine, I think. But th this is a guy that if you kick him out of the league, it doesn't. It does not make a drip. No. So you can say we don't stand for this. We believe in integrity. We're hypocrites. We know. Yeah. But we like making a lot of money. Well, I guess you can't say that. But 
you get to kick a guy out of the league and ban him that does not affect your league, does not affect your attendance, your TV ratings. You're just sitting around here going, thank God this isn't LeBron James. Oh, yeah. Or Kevin Durant or someone like that. But those guys have so much money, they're less likely to do this. But still, you could have made a nice seven-figure career on a yearly basis if you're Jonte Porter and you screwed it up. And to me, you just, you're not a very bright individual. You just aren't. And no. at the end of the day, the NBA got handed a golden ticket to lay the wood to someone just to show, to prove their point. Look, I will say this. I will people go, yeah, but it's 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 not fair and it's hypocritical that these leagues make so much money off a of gamble if they won't let their players gamble. I get you in what's right and wrong, but you know what else is you can't have? The integrity of your game screwed up. Right. Because then people don't watch. People don't even gamble on it if they think the integrity screwed up. Right. So even though you're in bed with the gamblers and you're all rolling around together, guess what? You still so, can't have players betting on their games or their sport. So per USA Today, his contract value this season was at $411,000, which that's not what LeBron and Duran and guys like that are making. Still pretty solid living that, again, if you manage your money the right way, you hang around the league for a while, you can make that money work for a long time. That's half what you and I make. Yeah, roughly. Roughly. All right. Uh, There's no prop bets for radio. <laughs> thank God. New NCAA transfer rule will allow all undergraduate athletes to transfer and play immediately if they meet specific academic requirements. Basically, the Wild Wild West just got wilder. Um, the decision isn't final until the meetings end uh, today. The rule still needs to be formally approved by the NCAA's executive board on Monday. But all that's a formality. You know why, Tyler? Because they lost in court again. Yep. Well, and, and and so this rule has been retroactively in place since yes. basically the beginning of the year because basically the courts uh, put a freeze on it because it was mm -hmm. violating antitrust. But the NCAA basically said, if we can get this back in our favor, if you transfer within this window, the rule is going to go back to being the way that it was and you're going to have to sit out should the rule rule back in our favor, which we knew it wasn't going to. Yeah. So now this is officially confirming that going forward, there is no longer any penalty when it comes to sitting out, depending on how many times you transfer. Because, yeah, again, you used to have the one time, go wherever you want, no penalty. Uh, the second time, if you're not a graduate, mm -hmm. you had to get a waiver. Tez Walker situation, all that stuff that blew up last year, that's gone out the window. Done. If you want to go to four different go schools in four years, go for it. Mm -hmm. So, again, the NCAA not being proactive when they should have been years ago has led you to more chaos. This has become a recurring theme, Terry. Yes, recurring theme. And at the end of the day, one thing can make all this make sense. Collective bargaining. So instead of that, we will just have the wild, wild west of you can transfer anytime, anyplace, anywhere you want, go anywhere. None of it matters anymore. And look, I'm all for athletes being able to transfer and go play wherever sure. they want. Of I course. really am. It's just even professional leagues have rules. They do. And regulations and timelines. Guess what? Colleges don't. Well, professional leagues set regulations and then create the rules as a result of that. In college, you have the rules and try and set regulations around those, and that hasn't worked yet. But you know what, we know what they do every time? Break antitrust laws. <laughs> and you know what? There's, there's something that we're not even thinking about right now that's probably also breaking antitrust laws that within the next calendar year, the NCAA is probably going to lose a court and, case over. And you know why the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NHL, professional soccer leagues, none of them break antitrust laws? Because they have unions and collective bargaining agreements where they sit down with everybody and hammer out the details of how everybody's going to be compensated fairly and how all the money's going to work and everything like that. TV contracts with college football is just like ads. Ah, Figure Don't it out. need that. We yeah. like this Wild Wild West. We're just going to whine and moan about it, but do nothing. All right, we'll get back in here. Today is April 18th, and that has to be the greatest day in the history of the world. Sponsor 1 800 Got Junk. It's coming up next here on the halftime show with Terry Ford and Tyler Head on the game.
All right, greatest day in the history of the world, sponsored by 1-800-GOT-JUNK here on the Halftime Show and the game, Terry Ford, Tyler Head, hanging out. All right, here we go. A couple interesting ones today there, Tyler. All right. 1987, uh, Mike Schmidt of the Phillies hit his 500th career home run with two outs in the ninth. Schmidt, look, where I grew up, Brooks Robinson's greatest defensive third base in the history of baseball. Okay. But all around offensive and defensive abilities, Mike Schmidt's best third baseman ever. All right. And I love George Brett. I think George Brett was phenomenal. But Schmidt, I mean, the power, he walked a lot, third base. He was a gold glove uh, defensive player. Which that's hard to do at third base. I mean, I'm trying to think of what third baseman I would put ahead of Mike Schmidt. And, I mean, as much as I like Brett, and, of course, I grew up in a house where my father worshipped Brooks Robinson, he did. He had a... He actually a, a statue. worshiped Brooks Robinson. Kissed it every morning. I, I've always joked with people, if Brooks and I were sitting in the living room and the house was on fire, my dad would go, hey, i got to get say, Brooks out. I'll come <laughs> back and get you. <laughs> You're on your own. What's your name again? <laughs> See you, Timmy. So Mike Schmidt is 500th career homer on this day in 1987. 1991, John Stockton of the Utah Jazz breaks his own NBA single-season assist record. Uh, St Stockton had 11 assists in the game. He gave him uh, 1136 for the season. I mean, Stockton, when it comes to just passing the rock, Stockton was unreal. That pick and roll with Carl Malone was unstoppable. And the whole time wearing Hooter Girl shorts. That was the fashion back then. By the way, the Jazz in the 90s had some cool uniforms. They were kind of cool looking. I'm not a uniform I, guy one way or the other, but they were kind of cool looking. I, I'm, You know, I'm a big uniform guy. A little bit. You the, like the, them a little bit. The, 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 the cartoony 80s and 90s NBA uniforms, truly some of the best. You dig those? I dig those. Like, it, it had its own personality, and I think the Jazz were pretty nice. All right, 1995, uh, Joe Montana announced his retirement from football. I was always a huge Joe Montana fan. I was a 49er fan because my – hometown lost football for a while um and I, I just thought montana was as i've gotten older i i respect john elway more as i've gotten older okay because i you know i got more objective because again john elway in my hometown don't have a great history sure but as i got older and got more objective i realized that john elway did what he did with less than joe montana had but i love montana I, i'm a huge man and obviously we probably Again, be the thing objectively, I don't like doing greatest of all time stuff, but no one probably, and Peyton Manning was phenomenal too, but look what Brady did in his era. Sure. And I also look at what Montana did in his era, but I give Elway more respect of that same era because I got older and lost my, my bitter hate for John Elway. Right. I realized just, Dan Reeves just said, dude, go take the ball and make something happen. Yeah. And and it wasn't one until Mike Shanahan showed up that they really put together an offense yeah and i mean elway elway did a lot and those bronco teams a lot of times when they put when played the nfc were outmanned and outmatched like nobody's business right so but i love montana and and this day in 1995 he announced his retirement uh and some guy named peyton manning on this day was the first round pick in 1998 of the indianapolis colts do you know because, again, uh, 1998, how old were you? Uh, Two. Well, I wouldn't have even turned two at this point in time. At the draft, you would still been, won one? Would have been approaching my second birthday. Yeah, just reminds me how old I am. Thanks. There were there were NFL people that would have taken Ryan Leaf over Peyton Manning. Oh, I know. I've, uh, you know, I watched the uh, the 30 for 30 they did last year about that Heisman race in, uh, what, 97. Yeah, it was good, um, wasn't it? Which was good. And, mm -hmm. obviously, Ryan Leaf was in that as well as Peyton Manning and, you know, hearing people talk about what Ryan Leaf was supposed to be as a pro, like, I see what they meant, and dude was built like a freaking house. Like, mm -hmm. I get it. Um, he obviously didn't have things a as good between the ears as Peyton Manning did, and he is the quintessential definition of a bus mm -hmm. now. And those guys in those personnel rooms back in 1998 won't admit it, but there were guys, if they would have had the first pick, the card would have said Ryan Leaf. Probably so. And Mike Price, his coach at Washington State, People said Price hit. Price did um, the opposite. We were talking about Robert Kraft early, giving yeah, yeah. not not giving a recommendation for Bill Belichick. Yeah, Mike Price, glowingly about Ryan Leaf. Well, Mike Price has proven to be one hundred percent authentic, yes. and you can trust everything that he says. Why right? are you using the corporate card, Mike? What are you doing? Tide Cash, roll. Mike. Roll tide, baby. It's rolling. <laughs> 
1999, we talked about um, careers ending. Wayne Gretzky ends his NHL career at Madison Square Garden in his final game. Playing for the Rangers was Gretzky at the time. It's one of those things we talked about the other day, like with uh, with Jordan, where you just have a, the end of your career somewhere else where people don't associate you with. And like, oh, yeah, he played for the Rangers. Uh, I, I think Gretzky played for the St. Louis Blues, too. I, you know, I mean, Gretzky played for a few teams after he left L.A. Because sure. most people think of him in Edmonton or in L.A. Right. But he had a few other stops at the end of his career. Two more. 2008, the NBA owners gave approval of a potential Seattle Supersonics relocation to Oklahoma City in a 28-2 vote by the Board of Governors. I mean, what they did to Seattle was wrong in so many ways. The people of Seattle are still upset about it from and what I understand. They should be. My, my son, who's really into the NBA, got an old-school throwback Sonics uh, jersey or right. no shirt. It's a right. really cool, like, T-shirt with Sonics and the, and the Space Needle and everything. Look, I get that they didn't get the money, the public money, to build a new arena. I understand that. And so if the, if the voters don't vote for to spend the money because god forbid you spend it on schools or infrastructure or highways sure or making your city a better place let's just build another arena for basketball but clay bennett was an oklahoma businessman where'd they move to oklahoma makes sense but the, it, it is the, fi the fix was in it, it is it is funny though every time there's like an inkling of like expansion in the nba it's like seattle's always the first one at the top of the list oh they, they should have an nba team there there's no doubt yeah I, I tell you what, I, the Key Arena wasn't great. I've been to the Key Arena many times. Key Arena wasn't fantastic. Great food, though. The NBA spread was excellent. But Seattle, if you build a new arena and you get yourself an NBA team, you have you have, and they've, they're talking about what they would do well, now where, to bring where, an NBA team. Where did the Kraken play? Yeah, that would be the arena problem. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah. Say, you already you, got like an you arena. Say you got the arena. You built, yeah. That's what I meant to say. You built a new arena. I think right. I said it in, past, in future tense. Right. They've built a new arena. They're ready to go. By the way, Kraken, best sports team. Best. Game. I want a shirt. I want a shirt. I love that name, the Kraken. All right, finally, because this, all right, if you got kids around, shoo them off or maybe turn off the radio for about two minutes. In 2001, AC Green played his 1,192nd consecutive game and remains an NBA record for Ironman streak. But AC Green had another Ironman streak. Oh, boy. His time in the NBA. The abstinence streak of A.C. Green. Very oh. religious man. Okay. The Lakers, by the way, that... What, nobody was, was, was thinking of abstinence but A.C. Green. Okay. There was a... Will Ferrell did a cool little documentary, a mockumentary about A.C. Green, and they called it... Well, I'm not going to say what they called it. It was... It was it, it premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. I forget what year it was. Back in 2017. Basically about A.C. Green and his, they used to send women to his room to try to get him to break his vow of abstinence. Wow. And there are some other deep dive articles about the culture of the Lakers at that time. Right. For A.C. Green to stay with his vow, that alone puts you in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I could see uh, how they put a lot of temptation in front of you. And and that and what the Lakers were doing as a team. Wait, what year was this? Oh, this is the '90s. Showtime Lakers, gonna, Magic I Johnson. This was the, I haven't seen the series, but I was going to ask if this was the Showtime Lakers. And and I, like I've, I've talked to some dudes who played in the NBA to stay abstinent for that long in the NBA. AC Green, that's even Good. more important, more uh, impressive than the Iron Man streak. Good for him. <sighs> All right, there's your greatest day in the history of world. Sponsor 1 800 God Junk. We'll come back. Firehouse sub text the hour at our text on 803 404 6100 right here on the halftime show on the game.
time for the old firehouse sub text of the hour at 803-404-6100 on our text line. What do you got there, my friend? Yeah, so we were talking about the now permanent rule that's been put in place by the NCAA about no longer being able to limit transfers um, a mm-hmm. second time with sitting out and everything like that. Jeff uh, weighs in and says, but apparently the SEC doesn't allow transfers during this current portal transfer window. Yes, within the conference. So the rule still stands. If you want to transfer from SEC school to SEC school, that has to be done during the winter. Now, if you're an SEC student or a student athlete and you want to transfer somewhere else right now, Mm -hmm. you can. And even if it is your second or third transfer, that's not going to prevent you from playing this fall. It just can't be within the SEC. But once this rule takes effect. Yes. Then that changes everything because now you're once again. What are we What are we going to do? We start limiting people. Goes to court. You go to court. So if you are limiting, if you're an NCAA conference, whoever, if you start limiting transfers, you're limiting their right to do what, Tyler? Uh, capitalize on a name, image, and likeness, which is a violation of antitrust. Yes, it is. So just, just saying. What rules are in place now, don't be surprised if all those rules go away because the NCAA lost in court again. As they typically do. As they always do. Because who are they? The uh, Glass Joe. (laughs) I love that. I love that. But everybody gets it. Yes, they're Glass Joe. Uh, So that's the way this thing is going. So, yes, SEC rules that have been in place, don't be surprised if they're no longer in place. Very, very soon. Um, and we appreciate the uh, text in the firehouse subtext of the hour. And look, this is where everything's going. Because, again, you have no guardrails. You have no any of these other cliches that people use. You don't have them because no one ever decided to put any processes in place because all you were doing was trying to hold on to your illegal rules that you've had for years and years and years because it benefited you. Right. Instead of understanding, this, this is the thing that, that always gets me. The lack of self-awareness when you realize the gig is up. you got two things you can do. You can continue to try to keep the gig and squeeze it for as much as you can, for as long as you can. Sure. Or you can understand if you pivot, you might be able to maybe not have the gig you have, but you might be able to continue on in some way, shape, or form that benefits you if you just understand that you have to change what you're doing. And, and I will say this. Charlie Baker has been very proactive in, in, in trying to move things along, and he had that pretty radical proposal not long ago about kind of creating this Super League type of thing that we've talked about so much. Whether that comes to fruition or not, I don't know, but it is nice to see a figurehead within the NCAA that's not just burying his head in the sand like Mark Emmert did for so long. Well, I think that now the, the people that really run the NCAA, which isn't the president, have opened the door for this because they have no choice now. Sure, they, they've see, got, they, they see the end is coming. Right, they've got to let this guy do this. If if you put Charlie Baker into the Mark Emmert era, Charlie Baker would have been as useless as Mark Emmert. Sure. Because the people above him, you know, the Wizard of Oz guys behind the yeah, pulling um, the puppet strings thing weren't going to let it weren't going to let it go on. Uh, one other, as we talk about, you know, rules and regulations and laws, schools in Virginia will be able to directly pay athletes via name, image, and likeness deals thanks to a state law signed Thursday, marking another significant step in professionalizing college athletics. States are doing it. S- it- Everybody, you, if you look, your state needs to get on board. I was going to say, and every state bill going forward is going to include something related yes. to that. because, And that's kind of the funny thing about these state laws is, is the later in the process that you adopt one, the more things that you can have in yours. Or if mm-hmm. you obviously amend the one that you have, you can add more things to it. But sure. everybody's literally just looking at what other states are doing and saying, all right, that sounds good. We're going to do that, and we're going to add some more stuff to it. Exactly. Look at the other one, copy it, and make it better. Yeah, it, it's become the new arms race of college sports where it's like, okay, what does your state say you can do with NIL? And I'm telling you, every state, you you, got to get on board. Yeah. You got to figure it out. All right, real quick before we get out of here, we we, we got all the sound but Dylan Stewart, uh, the five-star freshman edge pass rusher. Let's get a couple cuts with Dylan real quick, Tyler. Um, Dylan Stewart spoke to the media yesterday talking about, you know, getting up to speed going from high school to being a college freshman at South Carolina Cut 16. I'm getting up to speed pretty quickly. Um, like some of the challenges are like remembering hand signals, things like that. But that will come. So he's saying, you know, I gotta get it. I, you know, I'm getting there. But there's a couple things I'm learning. Mm-hmm. 
And then there's Dylan Stewart talking about, what, again, he's a freshman. We're hoping he can make an impact this year in some way, shape, or form. Here's Dylan Stewart's personal goals in the season. One of my goals is the freshman All-American, of course, and break the freshman record for sacks, which is six. I think it's obtainable. By the way, we figured out that record is not at six because Clowney had eight in his freshman year, so the bar is at least at eight, so he may need to readjust those numbers. Still, he's got goals. He does. He's got goals. So there's uh, Dylan Stewart, five-star edge pass rusher. Got to speak to the media yesterday, talking about a couple different things. And look, we're all expecting him. Well, now we're hoping that he can make some sort of impact in his freshman year coming off the edge. Right. Because the edge needs it. You got Kyle Kennard, a veteran who you know, had eight sacks last year. And so you know you have productivity there, but you also would love to see Dylan Stewart pop in his freshman year. All right. Fine job, Tyler. Appreciate it. Jay from the Heritage, you're right around the Heritage. And also Elijah Cunt next on the post game show here on the game. Seventy years of experience. That is what you get if you venture into the nest in the Vista on Gadsden. Let's say you want to get, I don't know, you want to change up the appliances in the kitchen, get a better look, a sleeker look. Maybe you want to, I don't know, change the shower, the tub, and the bathroom, maybe some fixtures. Maybe the, the lighting is off and we need to do something about the lighting. 803-978-2025. You call the nest, you talk to one of their experts who can help you navigate to what you're looking to do. They will go by your taste, your style, your budget, and they will put together a plan to help you achieve all your goals for your home while not uh, making you broke or you're eating ramen noodles. Again, 803-978-2025, 70 years of experience personalizing your dream for your home. It is The Nest, 1331 Gadsden, again, 803-978-2025.